It was a beautiful September day, but Sean Taylor was trapped in his car in one of the worst cases of gridlock he had ever seen. He tried to look on the bright side, though, and while he was stuck in an unmoving car, at least he had a pleasant view of the wide, shimmering lake just off the road next to him. He was admiring the scene when tiny drops of rain started landing on his windshield. That's funny. There wasn't a cloud in the sky a moment ago. There was something off about the rain, though. It looked dirty, a rusty red color. Was that blood? He didn't have time to think about it, because just then, a thick, dense mist began to roll over the lake. A fog of blood. Just off the side of the road, he could see a huge silhouette rising out of the water. Is that an old submarine? What Sean didn't know was that he was about to have an encounter with SCP-1861, also known as the HMS Wintersheimer, a ghostly submarine with strange and terrifying effects. Sean and the other drivers stuck in traffic that day were far from the first people to have a dangerous brush with this legendary vessel. According to SCP Foundation records, the HMS Wintersheimer has been appearing since as early as 1916. The first recorded incident occurred in the British seaside town of Innsmouth-on-Sea. You won't find this town on any maps or in the history books, and you're about to find out why. The 500 population of the town, which had already reduced by the wartime draft into the currently raging Great World War, awoke to red skies on February 6, 1916. Citizens left their homes to investigate, only to find their entire town had been enveloped in a thick red mist. The swelling crimson clouds up ahead began to rain, showering the town in a hail of viscous red goop. Anyone unlucky enough to taste it would say that this strange rain was a dreadful mix of salt and copper. This was because, as the Foundation would later determine, the rain and fog was a disgusting combination of salt water, human blood, and human cerebrospinal fluid. But the real threat was rising just beyond the beach. Technically speaking, the HMS Wintersheimer vessel is designated as SCP-1861-A. It appears to be a World War I-era British B-class submarine, designed by Vickers for the Royal Navy in 1904. By 1916, this particular type of boat was already on its way to being obsolete, and were largely deployed in Malta, far from the active fronts. So one of these vessels appearing on an otherwise unremarkable stretch of English coastline should have been a clue that something was terribly wrong. But the poor residents of Innsmouth-on-Sea didn't know the half of it. Soon, figures in what appeared to be archaic diving gear began emerging from the Wintersheimer and made their way into the township. They seemed terrified, running up to and frantically screaming at any local they could find. Please listen to me. Something terrible is about to happen here. We need you to come with us or you're all going to die. You must believe us. The locals were frightened by what they heard. They'd been listening to news reports of the Great War unfolding across the globe for two years now. Had it finally come to them? They pictured shells raining down from the sky, decimating their defenseless little town in a rain of fire. The Navy must have been brought in to save them before the German bombardment began. While some took more convincing than others, the men in diving suits, known as SCP-1861-B, eventually managed to persuade the entire town to join them and lead the townspeople down to the water. One by one, they were all boarded onto the submarine, hundreds of them. Many couldn't believe their eyes as they watched scores of people disappear in front of them into the dark bowels of the Wintersheimer. Where were they all going? How would they all fit in there? But it was too late for any of them to back out now. The vessel submerged once more, and everyone was gone. The entire population of Innsmouth-on-Sea had disappeared in a rain of fog and blood, never to be seen again. The Foundation wiped all records of the town from existence and delivered appropriate amnestic treatment to anyone who still mentioned or remembered Innsmouth-on-Sea. The fate of those who board the HMS Wintersheimer is always the same. Vanish from the face of the Earth, explained away by the Foundation as accidental death by extreme weather event. There have been hundreds of documented sightings of SCP-1861, and the anomalous weather event can occur near any body of water wide enough to accommodate SCP-1861-A's comms tower and topmost platform. Depth does not seem to be any hindrance of the submarine appearing, and it can even manifest in water that's just a few inches deep. 
as Sean and the other unfortunate victims of the rush hour traffic were being showered in thick red droplets from above, a crimson mist rolled in between the cars. Sean had heard of so-called freak weather events before, like raining frogs and fish, but this was something different, and it frightened him. He could see now that the silhouette rising from the lake really was an old submarine, and he watched as a legion of mysterious figures disembarked from the vessel and began spilling onto the road. The men in ancient-looking diving suits walked among the cars, and one of them approached Sean's car. He began tapping frantically on the window, and Sean could tell he was yelling something. Sean was scared and more, but more than anything else, he was confused. Against his better judgment, he rolled down the window just a crack to hear what the man was saying. His British-accented voice muted by the diving suit, the man frantically told him, Sir, please listen to me. I'm Lieutenant Samuel Ramsey of the HMS Wintersheimer. We're evacuating the area. Please, you've got to come with me. We're in danger out here. HMS? Sean thought. Isn't that what they call British ships? What was a British submarine doing in the middle of a lake in the United States? Through his windshield, Sean could already see other men in diving suits leading people from the cars out towards the submarine. Something had to be going on here. Something big. Lieutenant Ramsey was still banging away at the glass of Sean's window, becoming increasingly agitated. Sir, if you won't comply with my orders, I'm within my rights to take you by force for your own safety. Sean could feel the fear setting in, but he didn't know what else to do. He turned off the car and took off his seatbelt. He was just about to open the door when there was a tap on the passenger side window of his car. It was a soldier in what looked to be advanced tactical gear. There were several soldiers directing cars to drive on the shoulder to get around the mess of stopped automobiles. Sean looked to his left, and the man in the diving suit was gone. The soldier tapped again, and Sean didn't need to be told twice. He followed his directions and drove around the traffic jam and out of the mist. A half mile down the road, Sean was stopped by another group of soldiers and given an amnestic. He drove away never knowing how close he had come to vanishing in the bowels of SCP-1861-A. Sean was lucky that one of the SCP Foundation's mobile task forces had taken over the situation, but they were too late to help those who had already complied with SCP-1861-B's orders and boarded the Wintersheimer. The task force made it their business to save whoever they could but that wasn't their only directive. The Foundation had recorded a huge number of SCP-1861 instances since 1916, and now they were finally going to figure out what was going on inside. The Foundation had already discovered that those taken onto the Wintersheimer don't simply disappear. Once on board the submarine, they are forced into a diving suit of their own, which transforms them into new instances of SCP-1861-B. Upon realizing this, Foundation scientists devised an ingenious plot. Six months before this latest instance of 1861, the Foundation dispatched two members of D-Class personnel who were familiar with one another into the Red Mist. One was instructed not to interact with SCP-1861-B, while the other, named Sal, was ordered to enter the submarine. His mission was to report back all findings to Foundation researcher Dr. Clutch during the next 1861 event. The D-Class who remained on shore was brought in once more by the mobile task force during the September event that Sean witnessed. They checked each diving suit wearing anomaly until they heard a familiar voice, muffled by the mask. It was Sal, and he'd been transformed into an instance of SCP-1861-B. The human D-Class, receiving questions from Dr. Clutch via a remote broadcast, commenced the interview of his former friend. It is from this vital interview that much of the Foundation's knowledge of the mysterious HMS Wintersheimer is drawn. According to Sal, the interior of the Wintersheimer, which is a long, narrow passageway, is a spatial anomaly that seems to stretch on forever. This explains how vast number of people, like the entire population of Innsmouth on Sea, can disappear into the submarine at once. Sal reported that, about an hour after entering the vessel, the hatch closed and the interior began rapidly filling with water as the submarine descended. Prisoners of the Wintersheimer were faced with two choices, suit up or drown. Few chose the latter option, and as soon as the suit was on, the transformation had begun. As soon as everyone was suited up and the submarine had fully descended, causing the 1861 weather event to dissipate on Earth, the Wintersheimer had effectively entered an alternate dimension. The airlock opened, and the new recruits were instructed to step outside and take a look around. 
The Wintersheimer veterans informed the new sailors that everyone on land was likely already dead by this point. When Sal first exited the submarine, he commented on everything around him looking eerily similar to how it looked on land before the mist descended, but with one key difference. It seemed as though everything was underwater. Well, not quite that. It was almost as though everything was water, like the world had taken on a kind of flowing liquid state. Sal and the others existed in this otherworldly land of living water for six months, and as the months passed, things only got stranger. They found that they neither needed to eat nor sleep. According to Sal, all they did was breathe, and pass the time by exploring and talking to one another. Anyone who attempted to take off their suit would dissolve and diffuse into the same liquid that surrounded them. Dr. Clutch asked Sal about the other inhabitants of this alien realm, and this was when things got truly disturbing. There were dead humans and animals floating all over the place, missing their eyes as though they'd been scooped out, and missing their mouths, as though they'd been bitten out of their face by some kind of huge predator. Their empty eye sockets bled constantly, and Sal theorized that this may have something to do with the anomalous blood mists of SCP-1861. When asked to provide more information on why all the corpses were mutilated in this way, Sal said that one of his superiors on the Wintersheimer told him, The watcher of eyes and biter of teeth deemed them worthy. Whatever this mysterious being was, it seemed to be a powerful figure within 1861's Waterworld, and Sal felt lucky that he never had a direct run-in with the creature himself. For his final request, Dr. Clutch asked Sal to attempt to remove his suit. The Foundation had learned in previous instances of 1861 that the diving suits have anomalous durability, and it was impossible for anyone other than the wearer to remove them. Hence why the Foundation could never deal with 1861-B by using brute force. Naturally, Clutch was interested in finding out what was going on underneath. Sal expressed fear and anxiety at first, wondering if after all he'd been through, whether he could ever be considered human anymore. Eventually, he was convinced to remove the suit, and his worst fears were confirmed. The second Sal removed his helmet, gallons of seawater poured out, and the now empty suit collapsed to the ground. Sal's body was never found. Only some teeth and a pair of eyes were recovered. The eyes were later confirmed to be belonging to a young girl, and the teeth were identified as having come from a European red deer. And so, the dark mystery of the HMS Wintersheimer continues. Because of the unpredictable nature of its appearances and the resulting difficulty of containing it, the Wintersheimer has earned a Keter classification. The only containment procedure currently employed by the SCP Foundation is for mobile task forces to try and intercept the submarine when appearances are reported, and hopefully prevent or at least reduce the kidnapping of civilians. With so many questions left unanswered, all we can say for certain is that if a red mist ever descends on you, and a stranger in a diving suit tells you you're in grave danger, he's absolutely right. Did you ever have to perform a dissection in school? Maybe you had to carve up a fetal pig, or slice into a frog while nightmarish visions of Kermit and a widowed Miss Piggy danced in your head. Though it's rarely a pleasant experience, unless your tastes are on the morbid side, most biology teachers would agree that the best way to learn how something works is to take it apart. As distasteful as it can be to hold a frog's tiny liver in your hands, it definitely does give you a better sense of the pieces that make up the complete creature. But what if there was an easier way to look at the individual parts of a living being? What if you could take it apart without ever having to prep a scalpel or stain your hands with the blood of innocent frogs? Like most of the seemingly impossible things in our world, the SCP Foundation discovered something that allows its users to do just that. In fact, it can handle a lot more than just a frog, and its applications go far beyond the confines of a high school science lab. SCP-291 is a small, plain steel building with a large door on one side. The door has no handle or knob and functions similarly to a garage door. The door cannot be pried open by any ordinary means, and the inside of SCP-291 can only be accessed if the structure is connected to a suitable power source. Once a power source has been connected, the door races and exposes a room inside. It is small, about 4 by 2 meters. It contains a console board, a large screen, and a plexiglass container resembling a coffin. How very sinister. The coffin is large enough to contain a human under 7 feet tall, 
So sorry, Ferdinand the Cannibal, you're going to need to sit this one out. The coffin sits on a conveyor belt, with several tubes connected to the wall above it. On the opposite side of the room, there are holes of varying sizes, each containing a small door that can be opened or closed. Because initial observation indicated that SCP-291 was intended for some kind of human testing, a D-Class test subject was selected for experimentation. The subject was instructed to lie down in the coffin and wait to see what would happen next. The display screen lit up, depicting a grid-lined image of the test subject. Buttons along the console board adjusted the image, showing the skin, muscles, and organ systems of the person in the coffin. There were no words or numbers on the screen, and all of the buttons appeared to have only two settings, on and off. When one of the researchers pressed the first button on the console, the tubes above the coffin began pouring a blue liquid into it. The test subject reacted with confusion, but did not experience any adverse effects. They quickly lost consciousness, indicating that the liquid was some sort of sedative. The liquid continued to pour into the coffin until the vessel was completely filled, at which point it congealed into a thick gel. The test subject's breathing and heartbeat slowed to a stop, and the conveyor belt suddenly creaked to life. The coffin was carried, test subject inside, through a small door that immediately locked behind it. The small room was filled with the sounds of gears turning, machinery clinking, and motors whirring. The display screen was taken over by a large rectangle, resembling a traditional loading screen. After 30 minutes, the process was complete, and the back door of the room unlocked itself. When the researcher walked through the back door, they found another room with a conveyor belt and a row of two dozen lockers. Each locker was opened, one at a time, and its contents removed for examination. Inside each, the research team found a different portion of the test subject's body, in a block of some unidentified clear substance. The body was divided in the lockers into these separate parts. Brain, lungs, and diaphragm, heart, digestive system, reproductive organs, left eye, right eye, upper left torso and arm, upper right torso and arm, lower left torso and upper leg, lower right torso and upper leg, lower left leg and foot, lower right leg and foot, lower left arm and hand, lower right arm and hand, neck and head, upper skeletal system, lower skeletal system, lymphatic and circulatory system, and skin. Phew, the miracle of the human body, right? boundless in its fascinating complexities. Each block of body parts was placed back in its designated locker, and the second button on the console was pressed. At this point, the doors to the organ lockers sealed themselves shut, and the sound of the machinery working filled the small space once again. This continued for a duration of approximately 45 minutes. When the machinery went silent, a new plexiglass coffin emerged into the main room, with the test subject inside. He looked identical to how he had looked at the start of the experiment, with no evidence that he had previously been disassembled. The blue liquid slowly evaporated from the container, and the test subject opened his eyes. The lead researcher conducted an immediate interview with the reassembled subject, who reported no memory of the process after initial exposure to the blue liquid. They insisted that the process had been like a good night's sleep, which honestly makes us pretty eager to take it for a spin. A medical examination determined that there were only a few changes to the test subject during the disassembly and reassembly. When they returned to consciousness, the test subject's stomach was empty, they were naked, and all of their hair was gone. With this new understanding of SCP-291's anomalous properties, the Foundation decided to continue their experimentation. With each new test, the experiments became more creative and, unsurprisingly, more depraved. First, a D-Class subject was placed in the coffin and disassembled. Then, instead of placing the various body parts in their designated lockers, the vital organs were removed from their storage before reassembly was attempted. This resulted in the equipment shutting down completely. A researcher pressed the third button, which forced a hard reset of the entire process, causing all of the blocks of body parts to eject via an exit hatch. During the next experiment, non-vital organs were removed before the subject's body was reassembled. The appendix and gallbladder were left out, and when the subject regained consciousness, these organs were still gone. However, there was no visible damage or scar tissue in their place. They were simply gone, as if they had never been there in the first place. So, if body parts could be removed from a test subject, could new body parts be added? Could existing body parts be replaced with different ones? A D-Class subject in need of a skin graft following a flamethrower-based accident was placed in SCP-291. 
Once taken apart, a portion of healthy skin donated by another, somewhat unwilling D-Class subject was placed in the locker, along with the skin already present there. Once the subject was put back together, the healthy skin had replaced the damaged skin with no adverse effects. Repeat attempts at this test showed that it was effective for limb transplants, heart transplants, and kidney transplants with a 0% failure rate across all tests. After determining that SCP-291 could be used for an untold amount of good, making organ donations easier and safer than ever, the Foundation naturally had to pivot to something more useless but interesting and likely horrifying. After all, it's not like they could ever just make anomalous technology available to the public, right? Two D-Class subjects, one man and one woman, were disassembled by SCP-291. The brains of the test subjects were swapped, and then they were reassembled. When they awoke, the subjects had the personalities and memories of the brain placed in their body. In a turn of events previously only seen in blockbuster comedies like Freaky Friday and the live-action Scooby-Doo movie, seminal piece of cinema, the subjects had swapped bodies. They were subsequently disassembled. Their request to look at their new bodies naked having been swiftly denied, and the brains were returned to their rightful bodies. After the experiment was finished, the subjects appeared mostly normal. However, they did complain of disorientation as well as mental and physical discomfort over the next several days. After going through two brain transplants in one day, though, that's really the least you can expect. After perfecting the practice of swapping body parts between different human subjects, the ghoulishly curious research team decided to take things in an interspecies direction. A variety of test subjects, including cats, dogs, lizards, fish, mice, and, of course, humans, were selected for this next round of experiments. Twenty tests were performed using these new subjects, and only three of the experiments were successful in transferring body parts from an animal of one species to another animal of a different one. Attempts to swap body parts between mammals and reptiles or fish proved disastrous. When a fish and a human were both disassembled and the fish's gills were placed with the human's body parts, neither creature survived the reassembly process. The human awoke with a new set of gills embedded in their neck and immediately began gasping for the oxygen they could not take in. Within minutes, they had suffocated. The fish's fate was even worse. It did not reassemble so much as it became a pile of goo, scales, and two floating eyeballs. Experimentation with a human and a lizard yielded similar results, turning the lizard into a puddle of organic matter and killing the human test subject after only a few minutes. As disastrous as the failed cross-species tests were, the successful ones were almost as bad. Trial 001 involved a cat and a human. Not wanting to attempt too much at once, the research team opted to just swap out one organ, the left eye. Both subjects survived the transfer and were able to use their new eye. The human subject reported full use of the cat's eye, with improved night vision in addition to trouble seeing color. The cat did not enjoy its new eye nearly as much as the human subject, and had clawed its human eye out of its head by the end of the following week. In Trial 007, a successful brain transfer was performed between an adult human man and an English Mastiff. The man in the Mastiff's body expressed discomfort with walking on all fours and asked to be returned to his body as soon as possible. The Mastiff in the man's body adjusted to bipedal locomotion in a few hours, but was disassembled after urinating on a researcher's shoes. The final successful trial, and the most unnerving, was Trial 016. A female D-Class test subject's reproductive organs were swapped with those of a pregnant Labrador retriever. An ultrasound conducted after the transfer indicated that the Labrador fetuses survived the procedure and could conceivably be carried to term by the human subject. Several members of the research team began to take bets on whether or not she would end up giving birth to puppies, but the transfer was reversed within the day. So we'll never know what exactly would have happened. Perhaps that's for the best. Personally, we hope the Foundation's Ethics Committee gives some of these scientists a very stern talking to about their behavior on this one. When not in use for testing, SCP-291 is to be disconnected from any power sources. At least two personnel are positioned outside of its containment at all times, standing guard, and these personnel must be swapped out every week. When it is not connected to any power sources, SCP-291 is considered harmless, though it should still be treated with caution. The main entryway remains closed and locked when there is no available power source, but the door can be opened manually from the inside in the event of an emergency. Any disassembled organisms are stored in a locker in the containment facility. 
labeled with a Sharpie marker in order to keep track of what specimens are stored there. Whether this is the same Sharpie used to label food in the break room fridge is unknown, but just like Dr. De Ramiro's ham sandwich, it's best to leave these items untouched. Any personnel found to be responsible for missing specimens will be transferred to another project and receive a strongly worded email. The Foundation regularly deals with anomalies of a more sinister nature. The most frightening among these, of course, are the ones that stalk and kill Foundation operatives. For no clear rhyme or reason, sometimes the Foundation's agents and researchers become subject to things that seek to entrap and utterly consume them. Dr. Elizabeth Graham is one such poor soul. Nowadays her name is whispered through mess halls and cubicles, since no one really seems to know what happened to her. One moment she was carrying a stack of files between two offices, the next completely gone. The Foundation's security teams couldn't figure out what happened to her. The CCTV cameras just showed her blinking out of existence and the files falling to the floor. Her biometric scanners simply returned a dead signal. It seemed that one day, Dr. Graham simply ceased to exist. Of course, the Foundation isn't above keeping secrets from its own personnel. Perhaps they did find something. A series of SCP documents, covered in sand, suddenly appearing in Graham's office one day, neatly stacked and paperclipped, all signed by her in her own handwriting, and detailing her days spent in a pocket reality of some sort. It wouldn't be the first time it had happened. The infamous Red Reality incident with Dr. Robert Scranton had already upset researchers, and there was no reason to alarm them further about something they couldn't change. So Dr. Graham's papers were covered up and relegated to long-term storage, where they would likely never be thought of again. But don't you wonder, what happened to Dr. Graham? The first thing Dr. Graham felt when she woke up was confusion. She didn't remember falling asleep. In fact, she didn't remember much at all. She had been moving files between two offices at Site-22 on a normal workday. She said hello to some of her co-workers and had a late lunch before returning to work. And then, nothing. The second thing she felt was fear. She looked around and realized she was in some kind of desert. A bright blue sky was overhead, and there seemed to be a sun. But all around her was sand. Massive sand dunes, flowing sand plains, and even what looked like a sandstorm in the distance. But all there was, was sand. Dr. Graham then noticed she was still holding some things. A small folder, filled with paperclip documents. Pulling one out, she realized what it was. A template document for an SCP file, complete with sections for object class, containment procedures, and descriptions. This place was obviously not normal but she had been anomalously transported to it. It needed to be documented. There was nothing else to do, so she sat down and began to write. She guessed at a number. Who knows what SCP the Foundation was on now. Might as well pick something for the middle. She scrawled SCP-3890 at the top and bubbled in Keter for the object class. The containment procedures were Spartan, but effective. No effective measures of containment were possible, and she would focus on simply exploring and finding out what was going on. Then came the description. No point in sticking to the Foundation's signature clinical tone, given the circumstances. It was more important to get the information down, and so she began to transcribe her thoughts. SCP-3890 is a potentially extra-dimensional or extraterrestrial space which I, Dr. Elizabeth Graham, was somehow transported to from Site-22 on 2-17-16. I am uncertain as to whether I was transported here due to my involvement with the Foundation. After finishing the paragraph, she picked herself up off the sand dune she had landed on and started to walk in the direction of the sun. She didn't have much information and exploring would be necessary if she was to accurately document the anomaly. It didn't take long before she came across something in the distance. An old, collapsed temple, completely ruined from the outside, the structure sagging in on itself. It had the columns and facades of a Roman building, she noticed. Peering inside, it was completely empty, except for more sand. In the distance, more ruins were present some older, and some more modern office-looking buildings. In terms of geography, SCP-3890 takes the form of a seemingly infinite desert plain, with ruins of differing architectural design poking out through the sand. I have noted the presence of buildings of modern design, along with what appear to be ruins of ancient Roman and Eryxian structures. 
She only noticed the first figure when the sun started to set. As the sky shifted to twilight, she saw a person walking, casting a long shadow. Excitedly, she yelled out to no response. When she approached, she saw a man in an older suit with completely lifeless eyes stumbling along. SCP-3890-1 is my collective designation for the humanoid entities that wander through SCP-3890. They do not respond to any stimuli, and as far as I've been able to tell, simply walk around without a specific destination. SCP-3890-1 are either entities that have been created to resemble humans but imperfect, or they are humans who have been mentally altered in some way to rob them of their faculties. There did seem to be some kind of a day-night cycle, and she didn't feel hungry or thirsty at all, though she did feel sleepy. After her first day in the desert, Dr. Graham settled in one of the collapsed ruins, drifting off to sleep. The second document opens much differently. This appears to be a document for something designated SCP-3890-2 Keter. The containment procedures are simply to always, constantly, be on guard for it, whatever it is. If Dr. Graham feels something she is approaching is not as it appears, she is to immediately retreat. The description is a little clearer. SCP-3890-2 is a living entity of varying shape and size, which resides in SCP-3890. I am uncertain as to whether SCP-3890-2 originates here, or if it was transported here at some point in the same way I was. From what I have observed of its behavior, it appears to be some form of predator. SCP-3890-2 is currently hunting me. I first encountered the entity shortly after writing down my initial observations of SCP-3890. It snuck up behind me while I was resting, and got me while I wasn't paying attention. I was knocked unconscious by its attack, and woke up several hours later during the night. It had attacked me several times since that first encounter, with several hours between each attack. She was caught off guard by it last night. She hadn't noticed its presence. It seemed to just be another building in the far-off horizon when she sat down and pulled out her pencil and paper again. She had started to fill in some more information about the humanoids. They seemed to continuously walk in circles around some of the ruins, though it was unclear to her why or even whether they were aware of what they were doing. But when she pulled her pencil out, she heard the buzzing in her head. It was like TV static, initially soft and low, but then ramping up and quickly becoming deafening stifling her ability to think. She looked up, and she saw it. For a moment, it retained its form as the building in the horizon, but that quickly changed. It began to unfold on itself, completely black on the inside, like a dark paper crane continually folding and unfolding, stretching and compressing in on itself. By the time Dr. Graham got to her feet and ran away, she began to realize what it had done and quickly scrawled it onto the paper. SCP-3890-2 uses amnestization as a form of attack. While it has not injured me physically thus far, I have lost all memory of significant chunks of my childhood and early adulthood. I can no longer recall which high school I went to or what my first job was. My current hypothesis is that, as an entity, it feeds upon memory. At first, Dr. Graham avoided buildings and stayed to the empty parts of the desert while walking. But when the creature appeared again, unfolding out of what seemed to be a piece of paper, it became clear what it was, a mimic. In the coming hours, it would pretend to be a star, a human, a fly, even a patch of dirt, while trying to make Graham come closer enough to consume her mind. The next document opens in even more dire circumstances. The containment procedures have shifted drastically. Containment now focuses on making sure that the mimic does not consume any memories that Dr. Graham cannot afford to lose. She is to write down all vital memories so she can recall them if they do get destroyed, and watch for its presence in situations and at all times. She writes the document while huddled in a vault in a bank dropped into SCP-3890, since it offers a little security from the creature, but the corpses of a family in the bank imply something less hopeful. They chose to die by their own hand, rather than let the Mimic get to them. Graham plans to kill anything that tries to enter the vault to ensure that the Mimic doesn't get in, but has bigger problems. I have lost all memories regarding how I came to be employed by the Foundation. I know that I am a Foundation researcher with level 3 clearance, but I simply cannot recall how I came to be in this position. Many of the SCP objects I worked with are also missing from my memory. I can tell there is a hole there, 
but I just don't know what was there before. Her memories of her own identity have been obliterated. Who she is, where she's from, what the Foundation even is, they have all been taken by the Mimic. Without fail, it manages to surprise her and consume an important memory, then dashing away as she tries to figure out what got stolen from her. Something small, like her favorite food or her childhood bedroom, or something foundational and fundamental, like her name and her sense of self. And avoiding it isn't an option. It can pretend to be any of the single grains of sand in the boundless desert, and Graham came to the conclusion, this is an infinite dimension of sand, serving as a hunting grounds for the Mimic. Of course, it could be anything else too. A brick, a window, any of the buildings, any of the mindless wandering people, or the clothes on Dr. Graham's back. Any of them could be the Mimic, and Graham thought of that too. It's why she hasn't let go of her knife in days. Even though it's dripping blood from examining the corpses of the former victims of SCP-3890-2. Even though she doesn't need to eat or drink, there is another concern. Sleep. The moment she falls asleep, the Mimic will no doubt be upon her. She hastily scribbled down a little bit more onto the paper before trying to rest. The sun's going down. I can't allow myself to fall asleep. 3890-2 will come in without a doubt if I do. I don't have to eat, I don't have to drink, but I still have to sleep. This place is designed for the Mimic's benefit. It can hunt its prey to its heart's content without them dying of thirst and starvation. Is this an enclosure, maybe? Some kind of sick game? My name is Elizabeth Graham. I can't forget that now. This page is my memory. The next word she writes on that paper shows something ominous. She can hear crying outside of her makeshift shelter. The next document things have changed. Someone named Tony is mentioned in the containment procedures. Someone Graham trusts to take watch while she sleeps and watches for the mimic. The descriptions explain. Tony is a child, only 10 years old, who fell into this dimension, the same as Graham, when walking home from the playground. The mimic can imitate objects, but it can't speak. The boy is real. They've worked on a rudimentary password system to confirm each other's identities regardless. Graham feels almost hopeful. Their chances of survival have doubled, even though they're being hunted. Not for their lives, but for the precious memories inside their heads. But she's still worried about other things. If people don't starve or thirst to death in SCP-3890, do they age? How long have the mindless humanoids been wandering around? How long has she been wandering around? Though she reminds herself of her training, she also faces the fact that she might have been exclusively picked for a past reason. I have this memory from my childhood still. Everything around it is gone, but it's sort of floating free, devoid of context. I'm visiting a woman in a hospital. I, I think it's a hospital, and I think it's a woman I know. A close relative? My mother or my grandmother, I think. And I go to visit her. I'm just a kid, 12, I think. And she doesn't know who I am at all. I don't remember what happened before that or after. Perhaps the Mimic brought her here because it knew she would hate having her mind consumed like this, but that would mean it wasn't just intelligent, that it was sadistic and cruel. She noted down she'd asked Tony if he had a similar experience, and they'd be a little closer to working it out. The document is hopeful. Dr. Graham now has something to believe in. The next document is a complete mess. Scribblings and scrawlings in the margins, and the text doesn't even begin to make any kind of sense. It's all word salad, the ravings of someone gone utterly insane. She mentions herself, her own name repeatedly and constantly, but in between are mentions of Tony, the Foundation, the Mimic, and everything in between. Dr. Graham has lost her grip on reality. That or whatever wrote this wasn't Dr. Elizabeth Graham. The document after that has a very simple containment procedures. She is to kill SCP-3890-2, the Mimic. Description. I woke up this morning. Tony was gone. He was the Mimic. It was smarter than I thought, I guess. I was stupid. I should have seen this coming, but I was desperate and it knew it. All it left was some scrawled document in a hole in my head the shape of my name. The Mimic, disguising itself as a child, had stolen the last thing she had left. Her name. All of Graham's precautions were useless. Even though her name was written down a dozen times in the last documentation, she cannot remember it. In fact, when she reads it, 
it immediately removes itself from her mind again. Not only has it taken her memory, it has taken her ability to reform them. And the document it left behind is one of her own, an SCP template. Though, of course, she doesn't know what the Foundation is anymore. The same document we have seen previously in the pile. Yes, the Mimic is learning to imitate Graham and getting better at it. Maybe that's why she hasn't been killed yet. It's yet to pin down her thought process and is waiting until it has her perfectly memorized. Not that she would know, given that she's forgotten how she even came here, or when. But the Mimic made a mistake. It took everything from her, even her hope which has left Dr. Elizabeth Graham a woman with nothing left to lose. She resolves. She will not get out of SCP-3890. The documents will probably wind back up in Foundation possession from some testing with an unrelated anomaly, but she will be a mindless husk, or worse. She plans to kill the Mimic. It's a cowardly, fearful stalker creature, and only hunts by pretending to be other things. She knows she can take it in a fight, and she still has her knife. The next document is Sober, the object class, neutralized. Dr. Graham walked boundlessly through the desert until the mimic jumped for her. It unfolded from a cloud, turning into a mass of black origami and lunging for her. It didn't expect her to turn around and slash outward with her knife, piercing its strange black flesh. It let out a scream, shrank, and Dr. Graham realized that it could feel pain. So when it lunged again, she drove her knife deeper into it before pulling back. And she repeated the process until it was a tiny black mite in the sand, and then she crushed it under her heel. It was that easy, that simple. But of course, every time it had come close to her, it had taken another bite out of her mind, just as she took another slash at its form. We opened each other up. I filled its body with holes, and it filled my mind with them. There's not much left of me. She curses herself from not having done it earlier, but maybe there was a reason. She can't remember it anymore. In any case, the Mimic's dying bites from her were particularly damaging. The straw that broke the camel's back. What's left of Dr. Elizabeth Graham is falling apart. She scribbles things down onto the paper, while her mind realizes that she can't even understand what she's writing anymore. The next document is empty. Not every story with the Foundation's agents fighting a monster has a happy ending. Picture this. You're out driving, visiting the more rural towns of your home country. It's been a long trip, hours at a time or sometimes full days spent on the open road, with brief stops taken only for gas and snacks. Every time you hit the next town, you stop for the night, maybe book a day or two at a local hotel to rest. Then you're right back out on the road again. It's been a little while since you left the last town, and it's starting to get late. The sun is dipping behind the horizon, and pretty soon it'll be night again. You don't think it's a good idea to keep driving all through the night until tomorrow. You need to sleep. The one problem is, you don't know the highway you're on all that well, and the people at the last town didn't mention there being anywhere else to stay for at least a few more miles. But then you turn on the radio, accidentally tuning in to some kind of locally produced tourism ad. Through the airwaves and the ever-growing evening darkness, you hear... Welcome to Chalkland, a nice rural town with a population who just can't bear to leave. Located just off the freeway, you'll find our town is filled with all sorts of colorful folks who love nothing more than to greet new faces. From the moment you arrive, you'll see firsthand the Chalkland locals' love for art and expression. And we even encourage our younger residents to get in on the fun and let their creative flair show. Chalkland. Once you're here, you just won't be able to leave. Chalkland? You've never heard of the place. It wasn't on any of the maps when you planned out your route, and it doesn't even show up on your car's GPS. And what's more, the people at the last town you visited never said anything about it. They said the nearest neighboring city was much, much further away. Did they lie? Why wouldn't they tell you that this other town was closer? You spot a road sign up ahead, pointing towards the turn for Chalkland, and decide to try your chances. A good night's rest and you'll be back on the road. Or so you think. In any small town, there are bound to be secrets. Local legends, ghost stories, even grudges between families that have lived there for generations. No matter how friendly and unassuming a place might seem on the surface, there's always bound to be something that people just don't talk about. 
The township of Chalkland, otherwise known as SCP-277, is no exception, hiding a fair few secrets of its own. Although the locals don't know it, they are living their seemingly ordinary lives under constant surveillance. Operatives of the SCP Foundation have been integrated among the townsfolk, embedded within the civilian population to monitor some of the strange happenings going on in this otherwise normal town. So why not take a walk with us through Main Street, down the avenues of Chalkland, as we draw your attention to some of the mysteries of SCP-277. The first thing you'll probably notice as you stroll around town are all the chalk drawings. They're everywhere. On the sidewalks and the outer walls of buildings, scribbled on trash cans and houses. Practically every playground in town has been turned into an urban art installation for these colorful children's drawings. Not at all that weird at first glance, right? Perhaps it's a good thing that the town encourages its kids to express themselves by having them draw all over the town with chalk. But these images coating the town, on every street corner and alleyway, they weren't drawn with chalk. These apparitions found throughout the area of SCP-277 might look like harmless art, but not one of them was created in the way you might expect. Little Timmy didn't spend a few minutes on his hands and knees dragging a lump of chalk over the concrete. Oh no. The drawings found around Chalkland seem to be projected directly from the minds of the town's children. All their thoughts, their wild and unfiltered imaginations, have somehow been plastered all over every surface you can find. The Foundation calls these images instances of SCP-277-1, with almost all of them appearing as figures drawn in white outlines. Creepy, isn't it? Like part of a crime scene. Luckily, some of these projections take the form of beanstalks, spaceships, anything from the imagination of the child manifesting them. An instance of SCP-277-1 doesn't possess any physical form or any substantial three-dimensional body, and the size, shape, and style and complexity of each drawing varies, all depending on the child that creates them. Additionally, it's only children that have the capacity to produce these images. Anyone over the age of pubescence is completely unable to do so. As for how exactly the children of Chalkland create SCP-277-1 instances, well, most of the time they aren't even aware that they're projecting their thoughts into the form of these anomalous drawings. It is an entirely unconscious and involuntary process. It's hard for the SCP Foundation to put an exact number on the number of children in Chalkland, given the sheer size of the town and its population. So, predicting the exact number of active instances of SCP-277-1s at any one time is pretty tricky, if not downright unfeasible. The Foundation agents embedded among the townsfolk have been able to confirm that these drawings or projections are capable of interacting with fellow SCP-277-1 instances, while physical objects can pass through them without causing or sustaining any form of damage. It is due to this factor that the children living in SCP-277 can often be seen playing with their chalk projections, and the existence of these living drawings is viewed as a totally normal and everyday occurrence by the adult residents of Chalkland. In fact, you can ask anyone who grew up living in SCP-277, any lifelong local born and raised in Chalkland, and they will tell you that the living chalk projections of the town's children have existed as long as the town itself has. According to the claims of the older residents, SCP-277-1 instances have been appearing in Chalkland for years and years, dating all the way back to when SCP-277 was first colonized and the earliest settlers arrived in the town. However, the Foundation isn't so sure that these claims are 100% accurate. For one, they can't even find a single record of SCP-277 existing before the 2000s. Even those living in neighboring towns refuse to believe that Chalkland is a real place that exists. Adding to the mystery surrounding the town of SCP-277 is the fact that all of its inhabitants also don't seem to exist, or at least have no official record of their existence anywhere else. According to tests conducted by the Foundation, the dental, DNA, and fingerprint data of everyone living in SCP-277 don't match any recorded persons on national population databases. And on top of that, none of the Chalkland residents have any memories of living anywhere else other than the mysterious town, or ever having traveled anywhere outside it either. 
No vacations, road trips, not even as much as a visit to relatives in the next town over. Naturally, before they implanted covert agents among the locals, the SCP Foundation's initial attempt to contain SCP-277 was to evacuate the civilian population. The plan was to remove the people from the vicinity of the town, relocate them, and then assess the local area's anomalous properties. What was it about that specific town that caused the chalk projections to manifest? Why were none of the residents' details anywhere on the national databases? And how could a single one of them never have once left the confines of Chalkland? Evacuate and assess. That was the goal. But naturally, things weren't as simple in practice. Multiple failed evacuation attempts were made, with some unforeseen incidences causing the operation to go awry. In an attempt to combat this, the SCP Foundation tried to vary the specific details of its evacuation strategy each time, but even then they couldn't get the people out of the town. What was perhaps far stranger was that every time the Foundation attempted a new evacuation, the civilians living in SCP-277 denied having any memories of the earlier failed evacuations. There was so much disbelief in the occurrence of these prior evacuation attempts that it caused the Foundation to question if these attempts even took place. The only record of the failed evacuations existing were in their own files. On the odd occasion that Foundation operatives were able to get one or two residents of SCP-277 far enough away from the town, they learned it was an exercise in futility. After spending any longer than a few brief minutes outside the borders of Chalkland, a resident would suffer some sort of violent incident. The exact nature of what would happen to them has been redacted. However, we know for a fact that they weren't killed just by leaving the town. Shortly after, these evacuated civilians would be found back within SCP-277, with no memory of ever having left the town. But what was causing all of these attempted evacuations to fail? What exactly was preventing the townsfolk from leaving? Well, the answers to these questions may be found in a unique instance of SCP-277-1, which are far more actively hostile versions of the chalk drawings that were collectively given the designation SCP-277-1-R. These instances first came about some time before the Foundation started attempting to evacuate Chalkland. One of their agents, undercover within the town and monitoring anomalous activity, spotted a seemingly standard SCP-277-1 projection in the shape of a rabbit. It wasn't a drawing that had been noticed previously, so it wasn't present in any reports coming out of SCP-277. But yet, there it was, at the local library. None of the town's children admitted to being responsible for casting this new projection. Unusual, but not uncommon. After all, they are kids. Think about it. We're sure that as a kid you might have done something that you didn't fess up to when a grown-up asked you. Granted, you probably never cast a psychic projection onto a library, though. The Foundation agents within SCP-277 knew that the instances of the chalk drawings could often be good indicators of the psychological state of the child that manifested them. So they aimed to keep an eye out for any further SCP-277-1-R rabbits with a matching drawing style. Turns out the agents found plenty more of these rabbits. Before long, sightings of SCP-277-1-R instances had tripled in frequency since that first one appeared at the library. But what was it that made these projections different from the regular SCP-277-1 chalk drawings? Well, Agent Davis of the SCP Foundation witnessed a cluster of these rabbit projections across the street from a diner. They were silently watching people or cars that passed by at a nearby intersection. The rabbits didn't play like the other sketches. Suddenly, the agent heard a scream from a little girl. She had been playing with her own chalk drawings that took the shape of a pony with wings. Agent Davis turned around to see one of the rabbits attacking the little girl's sketch, practically consuming the drawing thanks to instances of SCP-277-1 being able to interact with each other. At the same time, the attack seemed to cause the little girl to suffer some form of seizure. All around, the rest of the rabbits were doing the same, seeking out other chalk drawings and devouring them tearing them apart and causing the children that created their own SCP-277-1s to suffer the same seizure. Ultimately, any child who had their projection attacked by a rabbit collapsed soon after and slipped into a coma, with attempts to awaken them proving unsuccessful. Three months later, all of the rabbit drawings seemed to have vanished, 
with no clue if they had come from a child or were created from the town of SCP-277 itself. The local civilians gave mixed responses when asked, some claiming to have no memory of the event that put multiple children into comas. Meanwhile, other townsfolk simply stated that this sort of thing happens in Chalkland every few years. SCP Foundation staff noticed that the residents of SCP-277 seemed to smile too wide when they explained this, as if their town was a fairy tale and that the massacre was just a part of a happy ending. Still, if you're thinking of stopping at Chalkland, maybe it's safer to just keep driving. For more than a hundred thousand years, humanity has buried their dead. We commit the bodies of our deceased to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, in the hope that one day, our dearly departed might get to enjoy some form of eternal life. But eternal life might be less appealing than it sounds. Perhaps there's a reason that humans bury their dead. Maybe it's so that the dead stay buried. And luckily, they do. At least, most of the time. Accessible only via a cargo elevator, and not marked on any official Foundation blueprints, beneath the northwest corner of Overwatch Command lies SCP-5555. This SCP isn't a creature or carnivorous monster. It's not a gateway to another dimension or an entity with the power to rewrite the very fabric of reality itself. No, SCP-5555 is a mass grave filled with corpses, a pit of unknown origin and indeterminable death. Each body exhumed from within SCP-5555 shows various anomalous traits. These bodies can be removed from the mass grave without any incident, but given the incalculable depth of this vast, corpse-filled pit, continued excavation of SCP-5555 would likely only reveal further bodies and fewer answers as to how they came to be buried beneath the Foundation's Overwatch command. The bodies recovered during the initial excavation of SCP-5555 vary in their physical attributes, as well as their causes of death, when one can even be determined. One body appears to be a man whose age and ethnicity are both unclear, as is how he died. But his body is perfectly preserved, showing no signs of decomposition. Another of the corpses has its head covered with a burlap sack and a noose tightened around its neck. When these are removed, they reveal an identical noose and sack underneath. When those are removed, they reveal another, and on, and on, and on. The cause of death in this instance is at least apparent, strangulation, suggesting that the deceased was intended to suffer before their death. Some of the other bodies removed from the pit include one belonging to a middle-aged Alotik woman, whose entire skeleton is formed of ice that doesn't melt under increased temperatures, while a different body is a human male with 80% of its organs surgically replaced with artificial ones driven by gears and mechanisms that continue to tick away long after death. An adolescent female with dark blue skin has two severed hands grasping its throat, while a Caucasian woman was found with both of her eyes gouged out. Perhaps most curious of all is the coffin, crafted from black stone, that cannot be opened. All attempts to open it have been resisted by some form of internal force keeping the coffin shut. While it's unable to be opened, it is believed to contain a human inside, a coffin with a person inside of it. Those familiar with the objects contained by the Foundation may make a connection to SCP-076 Abel, a humanoid entity also contained inside a coffin. A curious connection, too. As you'll come to see when dealing with SCP-5555, the appearance of many familiar faces may be more than just vague connections. None of these corpses, or their various anomalous properties, answer any of the pressing questions about SCP-5555's exact nature and origin. In fact, the bodies found within the grave only raise new questions about this seemingly bottomless pit that the Foundation was either built over or knowingly hides beneath its lowest depths. The truth behind SCP-5555 is shrouded in mystery, unanswered questions piled on top of each other like the bodies in the mass grave itself. 
a pile that stacks all the way up to the highest levels of the Foundation's own administration. In actuality, the bodies buried in SCP-5555 are part of a vast and insidious game played by the heads of a number of GOIs, or groups of interest, as well as the SCP Foundation's very own administrator. But how do the corpses of these anomalous beings factor into the aforementioned game? And what is the ultimate outcome? Examining the file describing SCP-5555, albeit with adequate O5 security clearance, answers some of these burning oh. questions about the mystery at play. Dr. Everett Mann, the current O5-1, was the first to uncover the existence of SCP-5555 and the corpses contained within it. Mann created a series of notes detailing his findings, intended for his successor. In these, Mann claimed that the administrator, one Francis Fritz Williams, the only figure with authority above that of the O5 Council, blackballed him, meaning Fritz Williams had voted against allowing Dr. Mann to remain a member of the SCP Foundation. Everett Mann had believed the administrator to be his friend, so naturally, it came as a surprise when Fritz framed him for an elaborate plot to eliminate Mann's fellow Overseer Council members. Based on the information from his own O5-1 predecessor, Mann believed whoever took up the role after he was voted out would have to take up the role of killing Fritz for the good of the Foundation. But what connection between Fritz and a pit full of anomalous corpses could possibly warrant Mann's urging his successor to eliminate the Foundation's administrator? Dr. Mann's notes to his successor continued with detailed instructions as to how they would go about killing Fritz, and that firstly, they would require a lair. Mann himself was holed up in an isolated arctic shack for three decades after being blackballed by the administrator, before Fritz sent his own private death squad after the former overseer. Mann stressed the importance of having a defensible, isolated location, stocked with armed guards and traps for his successor to lie in wait for Fritz. It was because of the traps Mann had set in his shack that he was able to escape Fritz's death squad with his life. Secondly, Mann urges his new O5-1 successor to always have several escape plans in place, and to be prepared to leave the lair, or indeed any other location, at any time. Dr. Mann also suggested telling falsified escape plans to close friends, in case Fritz got to them first, or finding an SCP that allows the new O5-1 to teleport to safety. Third, Mann suggests the need for multiple fully stocked safe houses. After all, escape plans are entirely pointless unless you've got somewhere secure to actually escape to. Everett Mann also suggested, much like his advice with escape plans, to have fake safe houses or SCP anomalies on hand to get you to the real ones. How does one obtain access to an SCP? According to Mann, placing moles or blackmailing personnel within every Foundation facility is one way as doing so granted him access to SCP-268, a hat that makes its wearer practically invisible, which came in handy during his escape. Of course, installing your own trusted moles is a potentially tricky feat to accomplish, given that Fritz has the entire Foundation and many other groups of interest in his thrall. But if anyone has the power to do so, and by extension the power to bring Fritz down, it would be another overseer. Of course, Mann's plot to eliminate Fritz and highly detailed words of warning to his successor do little to explain the pit full of anomalous corpses. Contained within the file for SCP-5555 is an email to the Foundation's administrator from the CEO of Wondertainment, an anomalous toy manufacturer and one of a number of groups of interest to the Foundation. In it, the CEO congratulates Fritz on an excellent win and asks for a copy of an unknown file, as well as mentioning the leaders of other groups of interest, such as the Church of the Broken God. According to the email, this unidentified file was to be sent physically as opposed to electronically, giving Dr. Mann his next lead in uncovering the mystery of SCP-5555. Mann traveled to the headquarters of Wondertainment, Wonderworld, to retrieve the file using his special hat to avoid detection. Seems like an easy enough task, except Wonderworld is a pocket dimension that slowly transforms human beings into something 
else. Time working against him, Man hastily made his way to Wonder Tower and attempted to recover the file that would maybe give him all the answers to this bizarre, twisted oh. mystery. Unfortunately, Wondertainment's CEO, Dr. Holly Wondertainment, got to him first. Confronted by Dr. Wondertainment, Everett Man demanded to know who was involved in the scheme besides her and the administrator. He posited that the O5 Council might be somehow involved, but Dr. Wondertainment claimed that the game being played was above and beyond their little numbers club. Holly proceeded to point a large acid-filled super soaker at man and ordered him down onto his knees when they asked what purpose of the mass grave SCP-5555 was. Following a fight and the apparent death of Dr. Wondertainment, Man escaped Wonderworld with the file, containing an updated version of the SCP-5555 description and containment procedures. The key points featured in this SCP-5555 document are mentions of sealing the mass grave with concrete after completing the turnover and re-establishing the facade. It also mentions that any already cataloged SCP entering the pit will die with its personality, attributes, and any anomalous qualities being passed on to a new entity, which will appear close to the location of the initial SCP's discovery. So the pit can not only kill any SCP that enters it, but can also instantly recreate them with slight differences and reposition them. Does this mean the bodies in SCP-5555 are those of former SCPs? To answer that, we'll have to take another look at the corpses. Let's take a look at some of these bodies and try to make some connections. We already discussed the similarities between the coffin and SCP-076 Abel, the entity who also rests inside a large black coffin. Next, we have a corpse dressed in yellow, with a burlap sack covering its head, tightened in place with a noose, and removing it causes another sack and another noose to appear under it. If you ask us, that sounds a lot like SCP-701, the Hanged King's Tragedy, which revolves around a play that heralds the arrival of a mysterious entity that calls itself the Hanged King, a being with connections to the extra-dimensional realm of Alagada. The Hanged King entity in SCP-701 revels in decadence and chaos, so maybe it's better for it to be thrown into SCP-5555. Next, we have a corpse that's been altered with mechanical gears. That certainly sounds familiar, too. SCP-217 is a virus that turns the body into a clockwork being, replacing organs and tissue with the appearance of gears and metal. Foundation researchers even notice the similarity between the body and the appearance of a corpse fully transformed by SCP-217. But there's also the connection to Dr. Charles Gears, the famed researcher who acts as cold as ice and frequently researches anomalies with connections to the Mechanite religion and the Church of the Broken God. It's been long rumored that Gears' body is also altered, taking on the appearance of clockwork. There's no telling what this connection means, but it's definitely something to think about. Next in our retrospective, we have a white woman whose eyes were gouged out. While this doesn't exactly narrow anything down, the corpse's secondary anomalous properties certainly do. Photographs of the body show a pair of blue eyes that, when viewed through video, follow the camera. A girl and a camera? That sounds a lot like SCP-105, the photographer formerly known as Iris Thompson, who can manipulate the images in the photographs she takes on her camera. Iris is typically one of the friendlier, more approachable anomalies housed by the Foundation, and seeing her like this is heartbreaking. So if the corpses in the pit are former SCPs themselves, and existing objects are reincarnated and modified after being placed there, how many times has this happened over the years? Hidden files display text results involving numerous ultra-famous anomalies, including SCP-173, which reappeared in an art exhibit before it was contained again. But Foundation researchers were shocked to find that this time, the statue was made of concrete, giving it the appearance we all know today. Another test example involved SCP-049, the Plague Doctor, who was lured into the pit using a vial of liquid that he was convinced contained a vital component to his medical mission. SCP-049 reappeared in France, this time wearing the familiar Plague Doctor mask over his apparent previous attire. 
a gas mask. There had been mention of some sort of game being played by the Foundation administrator and the heads of various groups of interests, involving a number of anomalies and the killing and recreation of different SCPs, many turning into those that exist within the SCP archive. After Dr. Everett Mann's encounter with Dr. Holly Wondertainment, an email to Fritz from the head of the Global Occult Coalition congratulated the administrator for an exciting addition to the game in the form of Dr. Mann tracking the GOI's leaders. Some, such as the leader of the Church of the Broken God, contacted Fritz to express their displeasure at including the risk of being murdered by Mann. They claimed that introducing such a rogue element to the game after Fritz had already won felt like an indulgent victory lap. In addition, one reported that Holly Wondertainment had proclaimed dying to be unpleasant when she had woken up after man had seemingly killed her. In trying to uncover the truth about this sinister game, man had found himself an unwilling participant. It appeared that the administrator and the GOI leaders were immortal, and while they could be temporarily killed like Dr. Wondertainment, it wasn't exactly an enjoyable experience. Some GOI leaders even theorized that Fritz introduced Man to their game as a way of eliminating them, or their organizations. However, Man had no desire to kill any of them, apart from Fritz himself the leader of the entire game. In his notes, Mann urges his 05-1 successor to share the SCP-5555 file with the other members of the O5 Council to spread awareness of the danger that Fritz, his various conspirators, and their game poses. Traveling to England, Mann attempted to obtain Fritz's location from Robert Bumero, High Priest of the Church of the Broken God. However, he found himself trapped by Bumero and Herman Fuller, head of another group of interest, the Anomalous Circus. Fuller knew that Mann had worked alongside Fritz for years and could prove useful for the next round of the game, while Bumero told him to simply kill Dr. Mann, stating he wasn't worth dying again. However, Fritz appeared shortly after to take Mann into custody, threatening to kill his associates Bumero and Fuller if they didn't release Mann. While Bumero appeared more afraid of the dying process, Fuller refused to relent resulting in an exchange of gunfire. Fritz dragged the injured man away, patched up his wounds, and left him in a safe house with clean clothes, bathroom facilities, and a note explaining what had happened. Fritz's note told Mann that he'd left him a plane ticket to Toronto, encouraging him to travel there and to take out the critic, head of Are We Cool Yet? one of Fritz's fellow conspirators. The administrator also left another updated version of the SCP-5555 file, this time detailing not SCPs that had been replaced, but members of Foundation staff. It also stated that 05-2 to 05-13 were all dead at Fritz's hand, leaving only Dr. Mann, 05-1, as Fritz felt like they'd bonded. Reassuring the other leaders that he wasn't acting against them, Fritz explained through emails that he had shaped Mann into the perfect element for their game. Mann departed for Toronto, assaulting the critic in an effort to gain more information, while also simultaneously carrying out Fritz's wishes. Dr. Everett Mann, for his part, continued to carry out Fritz's dirty work, tracking the various GOI leaders and replaced Foundation staff, determined to topple Fritz and his game once and for all. Come the start of the new game, Fritz and all his associates had switched roles with each other. The administrator of the Foundation took on the role of Dr. Wondertainment. Dr. Wondertainment became the Prophet of Mekane, a representative of the Church of the Broken God. The role of the Global Occult Coalition's D.C. Alfin became Jude Kairat, a member of the mischievous Gamers Against Weed group of interest. This new iteration of the game also assigned Dr. Man the role of Nobody. His win conditions for the game were to kill all the others, having himself been made one of them, an immortal by Fritz. Assembling his notes for the future O5 Council, Man set out on his hunt for Fritz, carrying with him a relentless grudge and signing off with a single item on a to-do list, Kill Fritz. The story of SCP-5555 and the ongoing game that it relates to perhaps explains why we bury our dead. Sometimes uncovering them can reveal secrets that should never see the light of day. Some secrets, much like the dead, are best left buried. It was dark when you arrived at the office. 
Rain hammered down on the window pane, cold as death. Your therapist didn't expect a frantic call from you in the middle of the night, but he learned to take such surprises as they came. You called and drove over the second you had the dream. That terrible, terrible dream. He was sitting at his desk. When you entered the room, he gestured to the couch, encouraging you to take a seat and make yourself comfortable. Your heart was beating so hard you were worried it might break your ribs. Every time you blinked, you were getting flashes of the faces, those vacant, grinning faces with wide eyes and mouths wrenched open, hanging slack. You hoped to whatever god or gods you believed in to never see those images outside of a dream. What's been troubling you this time? He asked. I must admit, I'm getting a little worried about you. You seem so frantic over the phone. You tried your best to settle your breathing for long enough to speak, at which point you said the words you were hoping you'd never have to say again. I had a dream about Craglewood Park. You could almost hear the sigh your therapist was desperately trying to conceal from you. You'd been making so much progress, processing and working to move beyond that mysterious trauma. But then the dreams had come back, just as forceful and terrifying as they ever were. Your therapist asked you to recount it, just like he did so many times before. But of course, it's always the same. In the dream, you were a child, probably about six or seven, walking down a long, cobbled path, surrounded on all sides by these trees that looked like eerie amusement park animatronics. They had these big, rubbery faces stretched into eerie smiles, like something off the cover of an old children's book, The Craggle Trees. You somehow knew deep down in your heart that this was what the trees were called. This was, after all, Cragglewood Park. Those words, in whimsical, cursive letters, were written on an aging sign somewhere deep in your mind. You could remember it as clearly as your own mother's face. And you weren't alone here in Cracklewood Park. There were other children, wandering down that cobbled road like a lost scene from The Wizard of Oz. The trees grinned and gyrated and sang up against a painted forest background. Wait, was it painted? Or did it just seem somehow unreal? The memories were getting hazy here. The same goes for the faces of the other children. They were smudged out, forgotten. Why were you here? Why were any of you here? And where were your parents in all this? But those thoughts were blotted out by the singing of those awful trees. You couldn't remember the words, but the music was so clear. The haunting notes of a calliope organ, like a collapsing memory of a day at the circus. You and the other children were all walking in the same direction as though in a trance. What were you walking towards? The calliope only got louder with every step. A boy with a smudged out face to the left of you tried to speak, but his words were muffled. You couldn't hear anything over the music and the terrible garbled singing of all the animatronic trees. Then there were glowing lights and colors as you approached the end of the road. Something big moving in time to the music. A grand old carousel slowly grinding to a halt to let on the next wave of children. You and the others just stood there and watched it. Moments later, half of the crowd of assembled children, the boy standing next to you included, began to step onto the carousel. The light got brighter and the singing got louder. By the time you reached the end of recounting your dream to your therapist, you realized that your cheeks were wet with tears. You told him you'd do anything to get the dreams to stop. Anything. Your therapist just nodded and made a note in his journal. I'll get in touch with someone who specializes in this kind of thing, he said. Try to get some rest in the meantime. It can be detrimental to obsess about this kind of thing, but how could you not obsess? The second you got home, you did what you always did after having another Craglewood Park dream. You went straight to the forums. After all, the most frightening thing about the Craglewood dream was the fact that you weren't the only one having it. A number of people had congregated on a niche online paranormal forum to discuss their eerily similar experiences. Dreams filled with singing uncanny trees, half-forgotten children, and the hazy horrors of Craglewood Park. Each member of the forum alerted the others whenever they had the dream again and threw any new information into the pot. They came from all over the world, different ages, backgrounds, and countries making it impossible that they'd all actually visited a place like Craglewood Park at some point in their past. And really the only thing they had in common, other than the dream itself, 
was the fact that they were all only children while in them. None of them could explain the dream. Perhaps with almost 8 billion people on Earth, it could be a coincidence that this handful would have these peculiar dreams. Perhaps that's all it was. Strange dreams. A few days later, a stranger arrived at your door, telling you that they were referred to you by your therapist. They heard about the dreams, about Cragglewood Park. In fact, they dealt with similar cases in the past, and if you'd be willing to answer a few questions, they may even have a viable treatment for the strange dreams that have been assailing you for years now. What could go wrong? Anything that could stop you from seeing those awful tree faces would be good. You relayed everything that you'd previously told your therapist. Every detail of the dream, the rough number of times it reoccurred, and even the support group for the other sufferers that you frequented online. After you answered all the stranger's questions, they told you that in order to seek treatment for your strange dreams, you would only need to show up at a nearby building and tell them who you are. They told you that this is a highly confidential and experimental procedure, so it would need to be kept secret. You sign a non-disclosure agreement and happily submit to all their conditions. You'll do anything to stop dreaming about Cragglewood Park. Even agree to what you don't know is amnestic treatment from the SCP Foundation, or testing to see if erasing memories can suppress the Cragglewood Park dreams. You were among the first group of guinea pigs for that experiment. But hey, if it works, it works, right? And for a few weeks, it did. You submitted yourself to regular amnestic treatment sessions at a local foundation front business disguised as a legitimate medical center. You were skeptical at first. You'd tried every therapy and over-the-counter sleeping pill you could get your hands on. You tried meditation, regression, hypnosis, positive subliminals. Nothing had banished down the haunting dreams of Cragglewood Park. Those trees, those faces, those awful tinny songs. But to your immense relief, this new course of treatment seemed to hold strong. While taking the medication given to you by the Foundation, you got your best nights of sleep in years. A whole new world of comfort and peace. But then came a problem. There were supply issues. You'd need to take a few weeks off the course. And just as soon as you stopped taking the regular course of medications, the second your head hit the pillow and you drifted off to sleep, you were right back in Cragglewood Park. It wasn't fair. It just wasn't fair. Perhaps the nightmares would go on forever. You'd spend every evening with those other faceless children always wondering, who were they? What happened to them? Little did you know there were no supply issues. The Foundation just wanted to test the viability of amnestic treatment as a long-term solution to the Cragglewood Park dreams, or as they dubbed them, SCP-2571. Turns out the amnestics were only effective when the subjects of SCP-2571 were actively taking them. Given the Foundation tests have estimated around 0.05% of the world's population are affected by SCP-2571, with that number possibly on the rise by unknown means, consistent amnestic treatment for all affected was deemed to not be a viable solution. But if it's any consolation to you, you're not suffering alone. The SCP Foundation has an online bot known as I.O. Mandela, trawling the internet for any discussions relevant to SCP-2571. They also have a designated task force, MTF-57, also known as the Laughing Stock, to investigate and follow up on cases related to the sinister Cragglewood Park. The Foundation has conducted thousands of interviews related to the subject, but only three are appended to the file containing between them some revelations on Cracklewood Park that reveal it's actually far, far worse than a childish bad dream. Dr. Rayner, the research team leader for SCP-2571, conducted the first of the three pertinent interviews about SCP-2571, investigating the experience of one Rupert Dukasu. In many ways, Rupert's Cracklewood Park dreams were truly textbook ventures into this nightmare of an amusement park. He described venturing through the park saying, I enter this theme park, it's like Disneyland but smaller. There's no rides, just this long winding road through the woods. Everything's bright and colorful like a cartoon. And then there's these trees all around me, but they've all got faces. And they're singing, they've got these dopey cheerful looks. 
like in one of those old time cartoons, right? And they just sing and laugh and sing. Like all the other accounts, he reported approaching a carousel with the other children. Half of the children got onto the carousel, and he and the others began to leave. At this point, Rupert became visibly distressed while recounting the tale and said, Just as I'm getting ready to leave, I, I see something. A tiny tree sprouting up near my foot. It looks up at me. It's smiling, smiling with that big, dopey, happy grin. When I see it, that's when I start screaming. That's when I wake up. When Dr. Rayner asked Rupert why he started screaming, Rupert replied that the tree had his face. The interview concluded. Next, Dr. Rayner spoke to Janny Yearling, another victim of SCP-2571. Dr. Rayner shifted his line of questioning to the carousel specifically. Miss Yearling insisted that she never stepped onto the carousel herself. Some who did were smiling, others were crying. They hugged some of the children that chose to stay behind before they got on. The more she described what happened, the more distressed Miss Yearling seemed to become. She eventually broke down into mortified sobs from the recollection. When Dr. Rainier asked what was wrong, Miss Yearling said, One of the kids, one of the kids that got on. Why? Why did he hug me? I didn't, I don't even know who he was. Before breaking down into horribly desperate, choked, sobbing. The final interview and what it led to was the most eventful and disturbing of all. Why? Because this interview, conducted by Dr. Rainier with Randolph Blair, was the first time that a physical item in a subject's home proved that SCP-2571 may be much more than just a malicious dream. An old VHS videotape was found in Mr. Blair's attic, with the word Craglewood scrawled across the top. When the Foundation made Blair watch the tape and asked him if he recognized any of the images in it, he told them that he only recognized them from nightmares. He theorized that perhaps he'd been shown the tape as a child, and it had traumatized him. The Foundation didn't think that was the case. Dr. Rainier pressed on and asked him about a few strange details, like the resemblance between himself and one of the two children in the video, and the strangely vacant front-facing bedroom in his childhood home. At this point, Dr. Rainier realized that Mr. Blair wouldn't be forthcoming for much longer. He decided to use that little time he had left to ask Mr. Blair one more question. Have you always been an only child? That question would forever go unanswered, but Dr. Rainier could now take an educated guess. The Foundation watched and analyzed the tape, finding it eerily similar to so many of the dreams that came before. A young Randolph Blair and another young child that the Foundation believed to be his brother wandered through Craglewood Park with the others until they finally reached the carousel. There, Randolph said a tearful goodbye as his brother stepped up onto the carousel, knowing somehow that he would never be seen again. And as Randolph tried to leave in a panic moments later, he was cornered by another horrifying craggle tree, this time with his brother's face singing in his voice. Because Cragglewood Park isn't a terrifying dream, it's a terrifying memory. The ocean is a terrifying place. We've all heard the statistics. More than 80% of the ocean remains unexplored. That's most of the water covering the globe, completely unmapped and unobserved by science. It's a scary thought to dwell on, realizing that there's more water than land on Earth, and the sheer expanse of that water is so large that we've been unable to fully explore all of it. Just think, there are places in the ocean that have never been seen by a human who knows what's down there. If there was ever a personification of fear of the unknown, the ocean could definitely be it. Ancient shipwrecks sunk to the ocean floor, unknown sea creatures hiding away from humanity, and the general isolation of the suffocating dark blue the ocean swallows its victims with all of these images that come to mind when thinking about the vast and mysterious depths of the sea. And no one is more familiar with nautical mysteries than the SCP Foundation. Today we'll be taking a look at SCP-5007, The Bass Strait, a wave of oceanic anomalies fit to make any seasoned sailor shiver in fear. The Bass Strait is an area of ocean dividing Tasmania and the Australian mainland, it's also the location of an unusually high amount of disappearances. Sailors disappearing from their ships, fishermen leaving in the night and never coming back, even civilians disappearing from the shores that connect to the strait. The Foundation was aware of these disappearances since 1858, 
but were only able to craft theories about what was causing them. Was it an anomalous group of interest? Hostile aerial entities patrolling the skies above the strait? Phenomenon associated with unidentified flying objects? What about subterranean anomalies, weather patterns, or time dilation? For nearly a century, the Foundation was unable to determine the cause of the high number of disappearances in the Bass Strait. And then, the phenomenon suddenly revealed itself. In 1980, on a beach connected to the Strait, Agent Taberner, an operative of the SCP Foundation, was vacationing with his wife Mary and his three young children. The Taberner family was simply enjoying their day when they saw what looked like balloons in the sky. They were approaching quickly, and naturally the family moved closer. What happened next was a whirlwind, and those balloons the family were so interested in lifted them up from the ground and carried them away. Agent Taberner tried to fight back, but there was nothing he could do, except report to the Foundation what had occurred, and the organization responded in full force. The Foundation's research discovered that reports of UFOs and lights in the sky had coincided with many disappearances in the Strait, and that this was a pattern. The search for the four lost Taberner family members had become a large-scale investigation into unexplained disappearances along the Bass Strait, and within three weeks, it was determined that these patterns were consistent across the entirety of the Strait's coastal regions. Some witnesses were interviewed, but the vast majority of these abduction cases had no witnesses whatsoever. Of the minimal reports filed, the Foundation was told that there were lights in the sky, and that appearance of unidentified flying objects described as having the appearances of balloons. One such witness interviewed was a man by the name of Alan Stewart, a witness who was present during the disappearance of former Australian Prime Minister Harold Holt, whose disappearance the Foundation believed may have had a connection to the Bass Strait anomalies. During the interview, Stewart claimed that Holt and his family, while voyaging on their yacht, decided to leave the boat and go for a swim. Holt turned to Stewart and asked him if he could see the balloons around the cliff. Stewart had no idea what Holt was talking about, but Holt was insistent on seeing them. He swam deeper out into the ocean, saying that they weren't normal balloons and that there was someone inside of them. Stewart and Holt's family called out for him to come to shore, but he wouldn't listen. Stewart tried to rationalize what he saw next. Maybe it was the current sweeping Holt away, but he couldn't lie to the Foundation interviewer. Stewart saw Holt go further and further out into the water, and suddenly the Prime Minister turned around. He began swimming in the opposite direction, and he was screaming. Suddenly, Holt was lifted from the sea and pulled into the air by something emerging from the clouds. The Foundation thanked Stewart for the interview and continued their investigation. Two years later, in 1982, Emergency services received a large number of calls pertaining to UFO sightings off the coast of Norman Bay, Victoria. The Foundation was quick to respond, alerting task forces and local sites to prepare for an investigation. Upon arriving to the scene, they confirmed the existence of multiple entities that would later be documented as SCP-5007. They evacuated civilians from the area and successfully managed to capture the creature, which was later transported to Site-40 for containment. It was a sight to behold. The entity, now designated SCP-5007-S1, was a cluster of human bodies fused between a grouping of black tentacles of varying length. Each tentacle was fused to the skin it touched directly. The stomachs of the corpses were grossly swollen and distorted to massive sizes to hold large quantities of gases inside, the buoyancy of which the entity used to achieve a passive flight. Across the entity's surface were clusters of eyes and bioluminescent glowing organs. Many of the humanoid components of the corpses appeared to have been removed and misplaced across various parts of the entity's body. What's more is that the Foundation discovered that human portions of SCP-5007 appeared somewhat cognizant and aware of their situation. Their vocalizations were incoherent and barely understandable, consisting of gasping and whimpering, but the corpses were observed to implore other individuals to approach them when encountered. SCP-5007's behavior during abduction scenarios was documented during the initial containment event, and due to the Foundation's painstaking research, a pattern was established between all SCP-5007 encounters. First, the victim would be alone, or otherwise vulnerable, in a coastal location. SCP-5007 haven't shown a preference for weather, be they clear or hostile skies, but they have localized all of their activity to the Bass Strait in small coastal towns, beaches, or boats. 
SCP-5007 will then move towards the shore, stalking the victim before lowering its tentacles and appendages to grab the individual, snatching them into the sky. An SCP-5007 instance can even abduct multiple people at once. One event observed had eight men from the decks of a commercial fishing boat taken into the sky in under 15 seconds. Once captured, SCP-5007 instances will dart across the water at a high speed and take their victims to an unknown location. Discovering where SCP-5007 took their victims became a top priority for the Foundation. After extensive witness interviews and compiling a database of likely victims, they determined that there must be at least 16 instances of SCP-5007 unaccounted for. Personnel kept a close watch on the coastlines and waters of the Bass Strait and equipped various marine task forces with research vessels capable of tracking any instances if they encountered them. In 1985, the Foundation's research efforts paid off, and several survey teams operating in the area reported the sighting of an extremely large SCP-5007 instance heading towards a coastal town. A mobile task force was sent to track the entity. The team observed the entity from afar as it stalked a private fishing boat. Even from the distance, Foundation personnel recognized the likenesses of several missing persons as faces of the corpses of SCP-5007. The task force captain had to remind his team to keep it together, claiming that they were not people, but just parts of the specimen. But everyone secretly knew the truth. The fishing vessel was a private one, occupied by a small family. The entity slowly approached and quickly pulled a woman into the air. The family panicked and quickly tried to reach cover for safety, running into the ship's cabin. The entity ran its tentacles along the boat until it pulled the door open, snatching another two victims. The task force was unable to help them, as their mission was to track the instance to its origin point. It was a horror to watch. The task force implanted a tracking beacon onto the entity and quietly followed it out to sea over the next four hours. They then discovered a large gray reef with several shipwrecks dotted across it. 13 SCP-5007 instances floated over the area some holding on to the land reef with their tentacles. The entity dropped the abductees from the fishing boat, who were coerced by the entities into diving into a massive pool of water located in the center of the reef. One by one, each abductee was pulled below the surface by something lurking in the pool, all while the SCP-5007 instances watched. Disgusted, the task force reported what they observed to the main site, and the reef would be designated as SCP-5007-A. The Foundation's analysis of the reef led to the discovery that the rock covering it seeped iron oxide from an unknown source, and the rocks achieved growth at an anomalously fast rate, often as little as 40 minutes. All of the wrecked ships and aircraft that washed across the shore of the reef were covered with a dark stone. The reef was teeming with anomalous marine life, including SCP-5007, a red algae that fed upon the freshly grown rock, marine worms capable of levitation, spiders that lived in silk retreats underneath the waterline, small fish, and giant organisms resembling large clumps of kelp, which the Foundation had previously documented as SCP-4159 in a separate investigation. SCP-5007 often rested their tentacles on the outcroppings of the reef while inactive, but what caught the Foundation's attention the most was the giant pit located in the reef's center. Unmanned exploration drones found that it had a depth of at least 4,000 meters, and water samples taken from the pit revealed large quantities of human DNA, prehistoric bacteria, and unknown compounds that possessed significant life-preserving qualities. When a being was submerged in the compound, they were able to survive heavy injuries, even when fully surrounded by the liquid and unable to breathe. The Foundation's exploration of one of these shipwrecks led them to a journal. Most of it was illegible due to water damage, but one passage survived, located in the back of the book. It detailed the experience of an unknown crew member of the ship caught in a storm. It reads, Morsby spied land ahead, and the boys said that there are giant balloons hanging over the island. We are all afeard, but there is naught we can do but beach ourselves and help for rescue. Should I be killed in the crash, I want my mates to give this journal to my Mary. Might know I spent my last thinking only of her. The interior of the ship contained human remains inside but there were less skeletons than the Foundation would expect for a ship of its size. The location of the rest of the bodies was unknown. Another event related to SCP-5007 the Foundation documented involved Frederick Valentich, 
a pilot engaged in a training flight over the Bass Strait in 1978. Valentik's disappearance was marked by his latest communication with air traffic control, when he mistook an SCP-5007 instance for an unidentified aircraft. It seems like it's stationary. What I'm doing right now is orbiting, and the thing is just orbiting on top of me. Also, it's got a green light and sort of metallic, like it's all shiny on the outside. Shortly after this, Valentik's transmission was interrupted by what was described as metallic scraping sounds, believed to be the SCP-5007 instance attacking the aircraft and jamming its propellers with its mass. After crashing into the reef, it was believed that Valentik and his aircraft were pulled beneath the surface of the pit, just as the abductees had been prior. The Foundation decided to construct a provisional secure research facility on the reef. They named it Site-40-R and documented all returns and departures of SCP-5007. They also set up a series of containment procedures that resulted in SCP-5007 returning with its victims 83% less often than before the site's construction, but this was short-lived. In 2008, the site logged over 36 instances returning to the reef, with only two not having any fresh abductees. The instances' origins were unknown, and it was as if they appeared out of thin air. No other monitoring post had documented their appearance, or even spotted them before they arrived at the reef. It was years later in 2017 that the Foundation eventually was able to successfully explore what was deep inside the pit at the center of the reef. They already knew that there was a large entity lurking beneath, as evidenced by what happened to the victims of SCP-5007 that were later deposited inside the pool. All previous attempts to explore the pool were met with failure, as the water pressure of the pit's depths caused all craft to collapse due to hull damage. This time, however, they managed to construct a high-tech submarine, labeled the SCPS Nautilus, which was capable of diving a maximum of 13,500 meters underwater. They decided that a D-Class personnel would be trained to man the submersible and carry out the exploration. The mission was simple. The Nautilus was to dive to the bottom of the pit and to describe the depth readings. Cameras and microphones were equipped to the vessel. Due to the depth, remote viewing of the footage was impossible. Instead, the Foundation had to physically recollect the vessel in order to view the footage. Upon recovery, some of the footage suffered data corruption, but what was there shook those who viewed it to their core. The footage showed the D-Class's experience going deeper inside the pit. At first, it seemed ordinary. The trench had a number of rocky outcroppings dotted with black-yellow vines growing along the walls. Also present were various marine life forms, such as the spiders or the fish. Going deeper, the sub observed an SCP-5007 instance clinging to an outcropping. Several tendrils emerging from the pit's depths were wrapped around the instance and holding onto the entity, as if it were feeding from it. Another 16 SCP-5007 instances were seen resting along the walls, each clinging to the outcropping. As the sub went deeper, the D-Class remarked that there were dozens of plane and shipwrecks, but also well over a hundred SCP-5007 entities. Most of them were held there by the black tendrils. The D-Class, as the sub went even deeper, began noticing human remains. No short amount of them, either. Deep into the pit, there was a large mass of human remains covering the entirety of the pit. Bodies crushed and drained of blood, but still possessing intact eyes. Each individual was still alive, kept preserved by the life-sustaining compounds found within the water. The body stared at the sub and moved, attempting to grab onto the vehicle. The D-Class swore they were trying to say something, mouthing words to the camera of the sub. As the sub passed through the mass of bodies, it emerged into a completely dark, black clearing at the bottom of the pit. For a second, the D-Class thought he was safe. But then, a large black tentacle rapidly emerged from below and grabbed onto the Nautilus, dragging it even further into the depths. The D-Class screamed and panicked, but there was nothing he could do. The tentacle possessed a large cluster of eyes, mouths, and human heads seemingly grafted onto its mass. And then there was another tentacle, and then another. The Nautilus was pulled to the bottom of the pool. The D-Class's screams were still heard even as the picture cut out. Sometimes graphic body-altering images of the tentacle's features were visible on the screen, but most of the footage was indecipherable. After minutes of distorted, corrupted footage, the Nautilus was seen again, rapidly ascending to the surface. Somehow, it had managed to escape the entity at the bottom of the pit. Upon recovery of the craft, 
It was found that the Nautilus was covered in a thick, organic coating similar to a black slime mold, but with dozens of eyes growing from it. The D-Class inside showed severe psychological damage and attempted to harm Foundation personnel. They were terminated shortly after due to being a danger to those around them. Following review of the footage, the Nautilus was to be dismantled and incinerated, along with the remains of the D-Class. A reinforced containment seal was fitted over the pit, with the intention of keeping whatever was down there isolated from the surface. But this was short-lived. After the containment seal was fitted, Site-40 underwent a massive communications blackout. Every device on site received an email containing a single image of a large eye taken from a security camera. The text beneath it simply read, Found you. Some personnel who viewed the email underwent anomalous changes, growing new physical features such as eyes and other various growths across their body. The entirety of Site-40-R went offline, and the Foundation could not establish contact. In an emergency effort to do so, Mobile Task Force Gamma-6 Deep Feeders was sent to investigate. The task force's assault on Site-40-R was a daring effort, as the majority of the site was completely overtaken by tentacles, growths, and anomalous alterations. While numerous altered personnel were lost due to the mission, it was ultimately a success. Some altered personnel were able to be saved through extensive surgery to remove their anomalous growths, and after everything was said and done, the site was repaired and reconstructed without incident. Following the site's repair, there has been little activity from the entity within the pit, but the Foundation continued to keep an eye on the creature and the ecosystem of the anomalous marine life that live on the Bass Strait, never knowing what their next move might be, and always keeping in mind the risk that comes with dealing with these poorly understood entities. From the Garden of Eden to the top corner of your English teacher's desk, Apples have played an equal role in history's most remarkable days and also its most mundane. The sounds of teeth snapping through the skin, sinking into flesh, and spitting out seeds echo through space forever and onward. And for most of our earthly hours consumed by appetite, it has been documented to be a lopsided relationship between these two things, man and apple. Man getting the sweet taste and abundant nutrients, apples getting nothing but pain and stomach acids. But this story is not found in our history. Buried in the lawful patterns of predator and prey, we stumble upon an irregularity, an inversion, an instance of apples biting back. SCP-4608, also known as Appleseed, was a 60-acre apple orchard containing over 22,000 trees, located just on the outskirts of Milan, Indiana. A town so small it strains your eyes as you squint to find it with a microscope, hovering just over a map. And to see what was actually happening within the curious fringes of society took even greater exploration, not just of the eyes, but also of the mind. Because what would eventually be seen would not so easily be comprehended. Physical senses are just the surface, and we need to go deeper. Our story begins with a great logging company looking to take ownership of the most fertile land they could find in the Great Lakes region. Ideally land that overproduces conifer growth so that the return on their investment would be plentiful and perpetual. These lumberjacked men knew what they wanted. Beneath their red flannel shirts and muddy boots was a deep intelligence and understanding of nature. Their process of assessing the land's value was meticulously calculated. They knew the soil both by the experience of their calloused hands and the literature of their study. They tracked various bird species' migration patterns in the area to assess what kind of seeds they'd be carrying and contributing to soil by way of their stool. They understood the local laws relating to clear-cutting and conservation and how both would affect their profit margins. This is all to say it wasn't just a speculative purchase. This was planned through and through and dwelled on. And yet, even then, with scrupulous eyes and careful crew, they missed the warning signs. SCP-4608 checked all their boxes, and then some. What could go wrong? And so they acquired the land, unwittingly purchasing the peril that came with it. On the first day of owning the property, one crew member noticed the branches did not sway in the same direction as the wind blew. He noticed the leaves didn't float down in agreement with their feathery weight but rather crashed to the soil like two-dimensional anvils and grand pianos. The roots were not ones you simply trip over. Instead, it seemed as if they stuck their leg out to trip you. When birds perched themselves up high and sang their songs, their cadence carried all the eeriness of an SOS. With all this said, 
He was happy to have acquired the land, and having already picked up and moved his family from the West Coast to now live and work out in Milan, Indiana, he decided it was best to look past his concerns. After all, it was the first day on the new site, and excitement was in the air, but with it also an amorphous, anxious energy. During the first logging expedition within SCP-4608, this same member of the crew hiked the grounds to better familiarize himself with the environment he'd be working on, hoping that if he managed the land properly and extracted the lumber as efficiently as his late father did, he would be able to help build the business and give his children the life he always promised them. He brought with him his notepad and took detailed records of his surroundings. He figured to achieve his goals and sustain long-term yields, he'd have to cooperate with his environment, but he never questioned if his environment wanted to cooperate with him. Would this question have changed the course of action? Or is brooding on the preference of plants an empty gesture best left for hippies at Woodstock? Either way, the orchard let it be known how it felt about a collaboration when hours later, the man was found dead. It was first believed by his co-workers to be a result of a safety equipment malfunction. Maybe it was a simple matter of thinking the skitter was in park when it was really in neutral. Maybe the knuckle boom loader went on the fritz how it does when the humidity ramps up. Maybe machinery really was to blame, in which case you call it a fluke and ask no more. After all, there's only so many questions you can ask a robot. But initial belief is a fickle thing, and it wasn't long until first impressions were called into question by the courts of critical thinking. The questions of the crew, however, only rang briefly, because shortly after the first death fell a sequence of others. In a matter of days, all of the remaining crew members were declared dead or missing, a word reserved for search parties still clinging to hope, a hot potato they would have been wise to abandon. For while it was hope that brought these search parties together, it was hope that sent them off never to be seen again. The Foundation was then alerted to the occurrences surrounding SCP-4608 by police reports accompanied by a photograph. A photograph of an SCP-4608-1, an organism consisting of unidentified plant-like muscular structures and a periderm resembling those found on common hardwoods. From the photograph alone, it was clear that this three-meter-tall organism was capable of committing the violence recently endured. Forceful in its demeanor, aggressive in its presence, and territorial in its perception, the photograph of SCP-4608-1 led to an even bigger question. Is this plant-like creature grown by nature or sown by man? After extensive research by the Foundation, records were retrieved that indicate the entirety of the 60-acre land was sown into life by John Chapman in 1826. Chapman was the type of man you could mistake for a scarecrow, both for reasons of preferred garb and body language. He was treated as such too. His personal space was respected, maybe too much. He spent his life alone, only accompanied and comforted by the things he planted. He maintained these acres all by himself until his eventual death in 1845, and it's then that it's believed SCP-4608 became unstable, reassigning its objective from comfort to chaos. When the newspaper came out the next Sunday, John Chapman's obituary painted him as a priest of the Allen County Church. But was this just the art of illusion? For as far as we know, no records of a chapel or congregation exist. A quiet choir, indeed. Come to think of it, it seems that everything within this 60-acre orchard was destined to be silenced one way or another, by violent force or even by conscious decision-making. See, while the SCP Foundation has had a long track record of subduing anomalies by methods of capture and containment, not all things are suited for locks and chains. SCP-4608 is better covered with a story than a tarp. A fruitless field that once produced at an unmanageable pace is now rendered incapable of supporting growth. Most will think it's due to a toxic spill. In truth, the spill wasn't that of chemicals on soil, but rather corpses on crops. A week after receiving the photograph of 4608-1, Site-81 sent a three-man investigation team into Milan. Their adventure was equally abrupt, a story with no reportable beginning or middle, but simply a predictable end. After four days of no communication, the Foundation presumed the three agents no different than their steak dinner, dead meat. And only then, after the Foundation's failure to solve the case, was it understood that what we were to be looking for wasn't people at all but rather answers to more nebulous questions. What's really happening here? And why is this happening? 
Following the loss of communication with the investigation team, Site-81 dispatched a high-risk response team, Mobile Strike Force Bravo-7, aka Hometown Heroes. These men had all the makings of heroes, and they were determined to prove themselves worthy of the title. While the Alpha Squad moved north towards the incident site, Beta Squad headed east, and Gamma Squad hurried west. The crews covering all directions of the compass but south, a coincidentally symbolic gesture, as if to say, we will not be taken down. The mission was simple in theory, find out what happened to the previous team and why. But alas, missions never are as easy as their objective statement reads. In practice, some might even call them impossible. As Alpha neared the incident site, they noticed the shadows on the ground beneath them did not resemble the shape of the leaves in the canopy above. They heard small drops of liquid tap, tap, tap on their helmets. Yet, it wasn't raining, was it? Alpha One ran his finger across the top of his helmet and then examined the residue left on his skin. It was raining, just not water. Oh, God! Upon looking up, he witnessed the reasons for both irregularities. Bodies hung from branches by their intestines, casting shadow puppets with their lifeless limbs. Blood dripped down like a leaky faucet. What did this? But before he could even ponder the answer, he heard a loud shriek from his radio, so loud that the radio itself vibrated, shaking its way loose from his hand and falling to the dirt. He bent down and picked it up, and this time gripped tighter, as if to tell whoever was responsible for that noise that they will not get away that easily. He and his crew followed this sound like a game of Marco Polo, blind to what may be ahead. They extended their guns and pointed them into the distant tree line, like zombie arms reaching outward in the pool towards the resonance of Polo, a small comfort in a giant game of distress. As they pressed forward, Alpha Squad proceeded past all signs that pointed them back, stepping over dead bodies like puddles on a rainy day. Soon they found themselves crouching down next to human remains, attending brief and hurried funerals for all their closest comrades, torn between staying to pay respect and marching along to earn it. The chest cavities of the fallen had been ripped open and filled with apples, a grim foresight into what they were up against. But nothing they could have ever imagined would prepare them for what they were about to see, and they wouldn't have to wait long. Another loud shriek from Alpha One's radio. It shot free from his grip and landed again in the dirt. The squad tried to ignore the metaphorical implications of this reoccurrence, quickly picking up the radio and shrugging it off, as if the five-second rule applied equally to communication systems as candy bars. They pressed forward, maybe out of bravery, maybe out of shame of going back. And while moving through the trees, they began to notice something alarming etched on their bark. What was it? There were unnaturally deep grooves on the base of almost every one of the trees. But what exactly were they from? Scratches from an animal or beast? Infection? Decay? Their eyes drew closer, but proximity brought them no clarity. These sigils and symbols could be dated back to occult Norse religion, but in that moment, they were incomprehensible to the men. Yet the message, even if misinterpreted, was very clear. Beware. Another shrieking cry over the radio. The bullets! The bullets aren't... They're not working! They can't... They can't penetrate the bark! Chaos ensued as an SCP-4608-1 flashed by. Alpha-5! Where's Alpha-5? A moment later, they will wish they had never asked. But when they tilt their chins and looked up, they find Alpha-5 bisected and hanging by his intestines from the trees. The grass is no greener over on the east side of the orchard, where Beta Squad gets lunged at by an SCP-4608-1. Their defenses are futile, but they fight nonetheless sending rounds to the attacker's chest, leading to nothing. If SCP-4608 had a health meter, it wouldn't have budged in the slightest. Understanding the negligible impact of their efforts and assessing their injuries, Beta Squad scurries to retreat to an abandoned chapel, taking a brief refuge from war only later to be named. Quickly, they barricade the door. In the chapel, Beta-9 tends to Beta-6's wounds, who is in the worst shape of them all, cut, bloody, and beaten. As he lays there grimacing, he shines his flashlight up and down the chapel's walls until he finds a reason to stop and holds it steady. Illuminated is an assortment of human skulls, and if this wasn't dramatic enough, he then spotted apple seeds embedded in Beta-6's wounds. Apple seeds that were starting to sprout. Beta-9 gave it to him straight. This is gonna hurt. He drew his knife from his belt and lowered it into his comrade's wounds. Beta-9 dug into flesh and bone, picking the seeds out one by one. Beta-6's scream shook the chapel's stained glass windows. As Beta-1 stood guard, he saw a blur rip past him, as if life had suddenly been turned up to three times speed. He spun around in a circle to try and keep his eyes on it, but as his vision refocused, 
He saw Beta-9 was now dead. He then shifted his gaze to Beta-6, who was looking less and less human by the second. Branches began sprouting out of his body like an all-consuming magic beanstalk. Out of his chest, out of his eyes, out of his mouth. And when there were no more orifices to exit, his body exploded making way for the new form that had overtaken him. The barrage of branches broke through the windows. Only two of them were lucky to be on the outskirts of inertia. Outside, Gamma-1 was on his knees thanking his dead comrade for the grenade he stole from his back pocket. I could always count on you to have my back, even in death. One hand holding a grenade and the other on his radio, Gamma-1 called off Alpha-7. Alpha-7, request for backup rescinded. Go grab a burger. I'll take it from here. Gamma-1 slowly glanced up and locked eyes with SCP-4608-2, a large apple tree with 13 human faces embedded into it, a perennial plant with great powers, a gymnosperm that had found a voice. Blood poured from SCP-4608-2's empty eye sockets. Gamma-1 smirks. Get some eye drops, sicko. He crawled over to the beast. The faces began yelling at him in indescribable tongues. Let me refer you to a speech therapist. He jokes as he pulls the pin of the grenade and throws it towards the largest of the 13 mouths. SCP-4608-2 chokes on the grenade, forcing it to inhale deeply, the strength of its lungs pulling Gamma-1 toward it and sucking him in. The grenade goes off. SCP-4608-2 explodes. The surrounding trees scream and combust. The orchard goes up in flames. The bodies of the fallen are given an appropriate cremation. Gamma-1's radio lays face up in the dirt. A voice rattles it awake. It's Alpha-7. Gamma-1! Gamma-1, are you there? Can you hear me? Please. Please. It's Alpha-7. Please. Gamma-1? On October 16th, 1947, Gamma-1 was recovered by the Allen County Fire Department, unconscious and suffering from exhaustion and smoke inhalation. The Site-81 concealment team took control of the situation and quarantined the area using the cover story of a toxic chemical hazard. The members of MTF Bravo 7 were posthumously awarded the Foundation Star for their efforts during the neutralization of SCP-4608. And so, the one question that remains is, how? How did SCP-4608-1 become so dangerous, and how did its danger slip by for so many years? Is its volatility by nature, design, or consequence? Could it be that the Foundation failed to understand the complexity of this creation? During Chapman's lifetime, there were no accidents or fatalities coming from SCP-4608. Yet, there is no reason to believe that SCP-4608-1 wasn't always capable of harm. Maybe it always was capable of mass murders, but simply had no reason to kill. What if the logging company never stepped foot on that land, never brought out their sharp blades and heavy machinery? What if this perilous orchard was in fact docile but provoked? What if the proverbial tree only falls in the woods when we force our philosophy on it? Though SCP-4608-2 spoke in unidentifiable sounds, the noises were always recognized and recorded as language. It spoke with intent, even if misunderstood. What it screamed is still unclear. Were they pleas for help, or messages of hate? And would one even be worse than the other? John Chapman might argue when facing heavy machinery and trained artillery, would raising your voice even be a moral decision at all? Is fight or flight imbued not just in blood, but also in bark? The SCP Foundation has a long history of experience with humanoid anomalies. From simple reality benders like SCP-239, to strange transplants from other universes like SCP-2273. But one of the oldest, strangest, and most lethal humanoid anomalies in the Foundation's considerable cabinet isn't a superhuman or a soldier. It is a man known only as Herr Chirurg. On first glance, SCP-542's containment protocol is seemingly standard. He is allowed to request personal items and furniture for his cell, so long as they are blunt and cannot be used to cut skin. Reasonable enough, and many such requests have been granted. The ones denied include nail files, clippers, and a surgery kit which has been set aside for testing only. But continuing, SCP-542 requires some special attention too. A blood transfusion every week on request, and even an organ transplant conducted by Foundation doctors should any of his own organs begin to fail. SCP-542 offers to do the surgery himself, but is repeatedly denied. To understand the story of Herr Chirurg, 
we must look back through time to several years before SCP-542's containment. Over the past three years, there have been a violent string of murders across America, England, and Germany. Interpol and the FBI are stumped, not only by the wide range of attacks, anywhere from 45 to 60 murders across three countries, but by the brutal nature of the attacks. The victims were found in various states of disassembly, body parts missing and tissue removed. They set up crime scenes and conducted complex investigations, but they were simply unable to find their man. In one month, four people in Germany were assaulted, with the muscle, tissue, and bone removed from all of their limbs. Three of them died from their injuries before help could arrive, and the fourth was an American woman staying at a shady German hotel. The only reason she narrowly survived the horrific attack was because of the actions of her neighbor, a Foundation agent passing through town. He heard sounds of fighting in the room next door at 3 in the morning and broke down the door to help unaware of the horrific scene he would find. A huge, misshapen man best described as a Frankenstein's monster. His skin was a patchwork of different shades stitched and grafted together. His chest was sunken in, his arms were grotesquely long for his body, and his face was skeletal and gaunt. This creature, that would come to be named SCP-542, was hunched over the fully conscious woman, vivisecting her leg to remove the sinew and bone. In shock, the agent pulled his weapon and fired at the creature, which escaped through the window unharmed. The authorities were called, and the woman survived, although without her right leg. Just before being amnesticized, the woman provided a statement to the Foundation. She had been staying in Germany for a few days when she saw a strange man on her usual bus one day. Even though it was summer, the man was draped and wrapped in layers of heavy coats, jackets, and a hat. Though his face completely obscured, the woman could tell he was staring at her from the back of the bus. Thinking it was just some creep, she ignored him and got off at her stop. For three days, she continued to take the bus and ignore the strange man sitting in the back. Then, on the fourth day, when she got off the bus that night and went to her hotel room, she found the window open and the lights off, and assumed she had been burglarized. But as soon as she opened the door, she realized she wasn't alone. Two freakishly long arms with disjointed hands grabbed her ankles from under the bed and brought her crashing to the floor. Before she knew what was happening, she was tied to the bed and the hulking hunchback was retrieving a surgical set and sharpening his knives and tools. Fearing the worst, she began to scream and the agent hurt her. But by the time he broke in and shot his weapon, the creature had already done too much damage to her leg. The victim was amnesticized and told her leg had been amputated in a car crash. The Foundation took over the investigation from Interpol, realizing this wasn't some regular serial killer. This was a creature, a predator, and to find it, they had to hunt SCP-542 like a predator. After a long tracking and manhunt across Europe, SCP-542 was brought into Foundation custody, and research into this creature could begin. To understand the story of Herr Chirurg, the researchers were expecting an animal or a monster, something they could study and dissect, which is why they were so shocked when the monster began speaking in tongues, German, French, Polish, before settling on English, all in a sharp German accent. The beast was introducing itself, Herr Chirurg, German for Mr. Surgeon. Preliminary investigations revealing much about SCP-542 and confirmed the agent's initial impression was correct. Herr Chirurg is a modern Frankenstein's monster. His anatomy has been warped and malformed, as the agent observed. His skin is a patchwork of large chunks of skin grafted or sewn to each other no two of which seem to come from the same person. His rib cage is warped and twisted, with all the ribs jutting out in different directions, and both his arms are different sizes, though both are incredibly muscular and far too long for his body. Attached to each is a hand, but filled with far more joints than any normal hand, allowing him to bend his fingers in almost any direction. His spine is hunched and twisted like a snake, and the skin stretched tight over his skull reveals a sunken cranium and a mouth with far, far too many teeth, none of them from the same source. 
and not all of them human. And these are all simply the externally obvious and most grotesque modifications. Foundation staff have conducted intense medical research, ranging from x-rays to comprehensive DNA testing. SCP-542's bone and muscle structures are asymmetrical, revealing the left and right sides of his body come from different sources. In fact, they reveal that almost all of his organs and body parts have been replaced with other body parts from different sources. His DNA is heavily fragmented beyond all logic. By any reasonable measure, SCP-542 should have died a long time ago. Instead, he is able to accept many blood types and organ transplants without so much as discomfort, much less the serious autoimmune response that any normal person would get. Not to mention, he is able to stay perfectly aware even while performing complex brain surgery on himself. Herr Hirug's history is as enigmatic and mysterious as the question of how he remains alive. He claims he was once a simple doctor from Germany, dreadfully normal until the Great War began. The Foundation has deduced this to mean that he began his modifications to his body between the World Wars. But it appears Herr Hirug wasn't just a monster on the outside. He claims to have worked for the Nazis in World War II, as they conducted brutal human experimentation, which he described as boring. The exact nature and timeline of how he modified himself without dying at some point is similarly mysterious. He professes that he didn't work alone. For more complex surgeries, such as implanting his second heart or replacing parts of his spinal cord, he had a team of helpers. Who and where these surgical assistants are now is a mystery, if they're even alive. After all, the Foundation has ample evidence Herr Hürig is able and willing to kill people for their parts. After all this exhaustive research on SCP-542, you'd be forgiven for thinking that he is some kind of mad scientist, driven insane by his experimentation on his own body. While no one can answer why Hürig kills except himself, he is almost frighteningly sane. This hulking monstrosity enjoys reading his anatomy textbooks, which he requests on a regular basis, along with filling out crossword puzzles in German. He's friendly too, described as surprisingly pleasant by the research team. He holds long, intellectual conversations on topics ranging from science and biology and medicine to politics and history, which he seems to recount with startling accuracy. In fact, tissue testing has failed to return a definitive age for the surgeon, He's incredibly skilled at the game of chess, and the research team is allowed to play with him as a method of interview. SCP-542 displays fluency in a variety of European languages, though he prefers his supposedly native German. At first, the research team was enthused with his presence, even if he was a little terrifying. Having a brilliant doctor to converse with was a great distraction for them. His ability to heal from intense surgery with almost no organ rejection or allergic reactions was considered a medical miracle. And rather than locking him up and throwing away the key, the research team decided to use him to try and harness this incredible power for modern medicine. His books and notes captured along with him reveal surgical techniques and methods far more advanced than considered possible when they were written. For his part, SCP-542 was happy to comply. He enjoyed performing surgery on himself with an audience, using himself as a living cadaver to explain his manner of surgery and the functions of the body. Unfortunately, observing him this close carried a risk none of the researchers realized until it was too late. You see, Herr Hürig isn't just a friendly old surgeon. His body runs off second-hand parts and is constantly failing. Organs stop functioning, blood flow ceases, parts of his body grow gangrenous and necrotic. SCP-542 is able to anomalously detect when this is happening. He is perfectly and acutely aware of his own bodily functions like digestion and prostasis, and he knows exactly when one of his organs is starting to give up or his flesh is beginning to decay. When this happens, the surgeon undergoes a drastic transformation. His pleasant exterior evaporates. He grows moody and withdrawn, snapping at people and avoiding conversation. He spends long periods of time observing people, using his ability to sense how well their body is. And then when he senses an opening, he strikes. Just like his murders in Europe, he picks the body of his victims clean of their body parts he needs and lets them die of blood loss. 
then he performs the surgery to replace his own failing organs with the new ones, and returns to his usual demeanor. This monstrous Jekyll Hyde relationship isn't purely need based either. The research team has discovered that Herr Hirug will also dissect people simply for the joy of the act. In one regrettable incident, a sewing kit was left behind in this cell. Several hours later, guards discovered a D class sewn to the mattress in SCP 542's cell, with the surgeon carefully and gleefully extracting his organs. SCP-542 Herr Hürig is a walking encyclopedia of medical and surgical knowledge, but all that knowledge comes from experimentation on himself and on unwilling victims. The Foundation has put him to use in certain projects, but all activity with him is to be strictly monitored and regulated. Despite appearances, SCP-542 isn't a person, he is a predator and an exceptionally skilled and dangerous one at that. One moment of inattentiveness can result in a fate much worse than death around him. But you can rest assured that if something does happen, your parts won't go to waste. Picture this, if you'll excuse that foreshadowing pun. You're at your local city mall in Ohio, a place that's never still. Every time you go there, no matter what time of day or day of the week, it's always full of people, all bustling about, shopping, eating, dashing past one another. Maybe, presumably like everyone else, you came in to get some specific item, or you might just be browsing. Heck, you could be there for a casual date, or to grab a bite to eat at the food court. That's when you remember, you need to have your picture taken. It could be that your passport is about to expire, or your driver's license hasn't been updated since you moved. Whatever the reason, lucky for you, there's a photo booth right here in the mall. Take your own photo, boasts the sign on the outside of the cramped cubicle, a list of instructions below describing just how quick and easy the process is. You take a look at the price list, feed the right amount of money into the slot, and take a seat inside. Pulling the curtain closed, you straighten your back, look directly into the lens, a short countdown appears on the screen. Three, two, one. A flash bursts from the bulb above the lens, filling the booth, and leaving those white spots floating in your vision for a few moments. You head back out of the cubicle, waiting to pick up the glossy paper with your photos on it as it starts rapidly printing them off. You wanted a two by two, four total pictures of your face. But then, as it finishes printing and you inspect the pictures, turning the paper in your hands, you're met with a surprise, an unnerving one to say the least. The pictures don't show your face. In fact, it barely looks like a human face at all. It has your clothes and your hair, but the whole image has been warped. Not just out of focus, but completely disproportional. Annoyed that you spent your money only to receive a highly distorted image, you wander off to find another booth, throwing the unusable picture in the nearest trash can. Now, sure, you might write off something like that as just an odd occurrence, a freak of technology caused by faulty machinery in desperate need of repair. But what you don't know, in fact you won't even realize until it's too late, is what really just happened. When you sat down and that flash went off, taking your picture and printing it off as a warped, unrecognizable mess, something was born. Located at the end of a series of long, winding concrete stairs and kept out of sight behind doors marked Keep Out and Staff Only is a lower level of the mall. Hidden in this dark, off-limits area that no member of the public is permitted to access, there is a service door, somewhere in the southwest corner of the third sub-basement. Just taking a look at it, you could easily imagine nothing at all interesting behind it, like a power generator or a storage room. But if you were to push it open and venture inside, you'd stumble upon something you would never have expected in your wildest dreams, or more accurately, your most disturbing nightmares. Beyond that service door is a cavern, hardly the first thing you'd assume to be secreted away underneath a city shopping mall. Although if you're into cave jumping, it would be ill-advised to take a spelunking adventure down there. The entire cavern isn't actually part of our world. It's an extra-dimensional space. Think of it as its own little pocket universe that has somehow become connected to ours and can now be accessed through this doorway. If it helps, you can even picture our universe as a big soap bubble, with a slightly smaller bubble attached to it. In actuality, it's infinitely more complicated and looks nothing like two bubbles of different sizes, but like we said, if it helps to picture it that way, then go right ahead. 
If you were brave enough or naive enough to venture deeper into this cave and not to be put off by its walls that look like they've been carved from pure limestone, then you would have had to watch your step to avoid a nasty fall. Within the large cave space is a deep, dark pit, a rocky conduit in the ground seemingly leading down into the earth. But taking a closer look, the walls of this pit aren't made of rock. They don't even match the limestone that the rest of the cavernous room looks to be cut from. The surface of the pit is coated in a slimy substance, closer to something biological, coming from a living thing rather than being carved out of rock. Depending on your familiarity with the texture, you might even say this substance is not all that far off from the appearance and feel of human fat tissue. Although you probably shouldn't reach in to try and touch it for yourself, least of all because the walls of the pit are constantly secreting a corrosive substance like acid that could easily break down your body by its molecules, painfully burning you until you melted down into soup. But there's something else down there. Lots of somethings, as a matter of fact. And the moment you took that photo, sitting in the safety of the booth in the mall above, a new something found itself born into the pit. It looks almost exactly like you, but its face is all wrong. You could even say distorted, like a photograph that didn't quite come out right. The abnormalities in its face could take the form of lacerations, cuts and open wounds, or bloody welts, like looking in a mirror at a twisted, injured version of yourself. Or this imperfect copy might have growths bulging out from its head, covering its facial features to make it virtually unrecognizable as a clone of you. Then again, maybe it'll just come out missing everything. No eyes, mouth, nose, just a blank, expressionless mask on a body otherwise identical to yours. And what does this thing, this clone, do now that it finds itself in a pit filled with other writhing, imperfect copies of everyone that's ever sat to have their picture taken in that photo booth. Well, what would you do? You would try to get out as quickly as possible, and that's what it will start doing. While you're going about the rest of your day, maybe stopping off at a few stores in the mall or complaining to the customer service staff about that faulty photo booth, it's already started climbing. Its fingernails are digging into that fleshy tissue that coats the walls of the pit as the copy drags its imperfect body upwards, crawling over the others around it that are trying to do the exact same. There's no telling just how many of them are down there, how many misshapen heads and deformed faces your clone has had to barge past and climb over as they all pile deep down within their hole in the ground. And what's the worst part of all this? It's not just the climb. The fact that your copy has to fight its way out of the pit, making the near impossible ascent to make it to the surface, no, the worst part is that you have no idea it's happening. You're completely oblivious that a distorted clone of you is raking its nails against walls of fat tissue, clambering up from underneath the ground. And even more so, you have no idea what it wants to do when it gets free and finds you. The SCP Foundation has long since been keeping an eye on the anomaly that they themselves have designated as SCP-715. Given that the photo booth itself was connected to the extra-dimensional space buried deep below the mall, removing it isn't really an option. Sure, they could have easily have cordoned it off and put up signs saying the booth was out of order to deter members of the public from trying to use it, but this was the SCP Foundation after all. They needed to run tests, figure out exactly what this anomaly did, and how it ticked. Gerald Patton had been a rising star at the Foundation, a promising researcher who had long been proving his mettle since he first became part of the organization. For a time, the higher-ups at the Foundation had planned to attach the researcher to the SCP-2090 project, studying a basketball player who somehow gained anomalous powers. However, hearing about the photo booth in the Ohio City Mall, he turned down this request to instead join the team researching SCP-715. Certain high-level staff of the SCP Foundation noted this to be strange. Patton had never turned down a promotion before, as the SCP-2090 project would have offered him better pay and more vacation time. In order to observe the photo booth closely without alerting the public to their presence, Foundation staff on site were disguised to blend in with civilians, and some posed as retail staff employed at the mall. Come closing time, once everyone else that worked there or who had been shopping throughout the day had finally left, the Foundation researchers were free to run their tests and investigate the anomalous photo booth. It was the night of a routine sweep, 
All staff members on site were required to test the surrounding area for reality warping anomalies. The sweep was mandatory for the entire team assigned to SCP-715, yet, quite unusually, researcher Patton didn't report in for the procedure. The higher-ups at the Foundation decided to let this indiscretion slide, though. After all, there were a lot of personnel involved in the process, so Patton was let off the hook. In fact, the few disparities in Patton's behavior only became more apparent when Dr. Agatha Wright began to more closely collate and process the files and information on the personnel on site. She was the research head on the SCP-715 project and quickly noticed a few things that didn't add up about researcher Gerald Patton. His rejection of the offer to join the SCP-2090 project and refusal to attend a routine reality-bending anomaly sweep might have seemed like unrelated incidents at first, but both would have brought the researcher into contact with technology that the Foundation used specifically to detect any distortions to reality. If he had taken the promotion or been present for the sweep, he too would have been within the scope of this specialized detection equipment, yet both times, he managed to avoid being put in such a position. What the hell was Patton hiding? And what would show up if a detector was pointed at him? Dr. Wrights was growing ever more suspicious of researcher Patton and his behavior. However, it was when she learned he had secretly tested the photo booth himself that she decided to take matters into her own hands in order to get to the bottom of what Gerald was up to. She had to mull it over and think about things cautiously. She couldn't confront him directly, at least not yet. Even the evidence she already had, that Patton had seemingly twice avoided situations involving the use of reality distortion detection equipment wasn't enough to prove for certain he was hiding something. Both instances could have been caused by something completely unrelated. Gerald could have rejected his promotion purely because he was more interested in SCP-715 than joining the SCP-2090 project. And even Foundation personnel needed sick days or skipped work because of a hangover without telling anyone, which could explain why he was absent during the sweep of the mall. But Agatha wasn't convinced. It felt like the two instances lined up too closely. They felt far too similar to be an utterly random coincidence. Even if Gerald wasn't up to anything dangerous, the only way to know for sure was to observe him, but without drawing attention to it. He'd deny anything, act completely differently, maybe even flat out lie if he knew someone was listening or watching. Agatha was forced to think in a way that was as calculated as she was certain Gerald had been. His quarters were located in a secluded part of the sub-basement, a level above where the fleshy pit could be found. Almost all the Foundation personnel assigned to SCP-715 slept somewhere on site, their presence there masked from the ordinary mall employees. Taking care not to be detected, they had installed doors with a keycard system meaning only members of their own staff could access the living quarters under the mall. If any civilians happened to stumble upon the Foundation and discover them, then all it took was the careful application of amnestics to ensure that they wouldn't remember a thing. Beeping her keycard at the door, Agatha slipped into the living area. It mostly consisted of a narrow corridor with rows of doors on either side. Behind each one was a cramped room, each only big enough for one person, a bunk to sleep in, and a sink with a mirror above it. Gerald's room was the furthest from the entrance, right down at the end of the corridor, as far from everyone else as he could get. Although it also meant if he came back from testing early, then he'd be more likely to catch Agatha leaving his room and walking back along the row. It would be hard to come up with an excuse as to what she was doing anywhere near his quarters, especially as her room was right behind the very first door, right next to the entrance. All this was rushing through Dr. Wright's mind as she squeezed into Patton's room. In actual fact, the interior space of them was so limited that they were even smaller than most ship cabins. Her hand had been clasped around the handle of a metal case, which she sat down on Gerald's empty bed. Unclasping the clips that held it closed, Agatha opened up the case and took out what was held inside the inner layer of protective foam. It was the Fulman Breaker Anomalous Optical Enhancement Device a piece of the specialized apparatus that Foundation researchers use to record and identify any person or object that might be exhibiting anomalous properties. It utilized state-of-the-art optical enhancement technology and could be used to detect whether a subject was causing any distortion to the reality around it. By accessing visual spectrums that were normally imperceivable to the naked human eye, or sometimes even unobservable in this dimension. Agatha looked around the tiny cabin, 
Given the limited space, she was also short on options as to where she could hide the device without it being easily noticed. It was also imperative that researcher Patton had no idea he was under observation. Dr. Wright looked over to the sink in the corner, the mirror just above it. Sure, it was a tactic taken straight out of the big book of spy novel cliches, but it would work. The advanced spectrum capabilities of the optical enhancement device would be able to record Patton through the glass. Luckily, the entire living quarters had been pretty hastily built, which meant it took little effort for Agatha to loosen the screws holding the mirror in place. But that's when she heard the distinctive beep of the door to the living quarters, followed by the gradual footsteps getting closer and closer. It might not have been Gerald, but there was also an equal chance that it could have been. Acting as fast as she could, Agatha placed the optical enhancement device on the wall and covered it with the mirror, frantically trying to screw it back into place as quick as she could. The echoing noise of someone approaching sounded as if they were almost right outside the cabin door by the time Dr. Wright had tightened the screws enough to keep the mirror in place. Giving a quick final scan of the room, making sure nothing looked too conspicuous, she grabbed the empty case and smoothed out the duvet where it had been laying, leaving no trace that she had ever been there. Her heart already racing, it almost exploded right out of her chest as she slipped back out of the door to Patton's cabin, only to see him walking down the narrow corridor directly towards his room, towards her. Ah, uh, Dr. Wrights, Gerald greeted with a stage smile, though the suspicion on his face was so unmistakable that it could have probably shown up clearly on camera. Something I can help you with? Patton. Agatha gave a polite nod back to the researcher, lifting the case behind her back. The one upside of the tight corridor was that Patton was so close to her, he couldn't see what she was hiding. The obvious downside being he might be close enough to clock Dr. Wright's suspicion of him. Did you need something? Patton chuckled. Sorry, it's just, what were you doing in my quarters? Her heart was still racing, desperately trying to form a plausible excuse somewhere in her mind. Agatha's free hand reached into her pocket, something brushing against her fingertips would have to do. Hey, you drop this, she exclaimed, pulling out a $20 bill and handing it to Gerald, a small price to pay to keep her subterfuge. Earlier on in the mall near SCP-715, I saw it fall out of your pocket. I had other matters to attend to down at... A anyway, I wanted to make sure you got it back. Oh, thank you, Gerald blinked in surprise, taking the money. As she squeezed past him and walked out of the living quarters, Agatha could barely stop her hands from shaking. Although those tremors of nerves would have to become the trembling of absolute horror when she saw the footage that the optical enhancement device collected. Patton was one of the creatures from the pit. It didn't seem possible. He didn't even have clearance to know about the pit, and any of the clones or SCP-715-As that managed to claw their way up to the surface were immediately terminated by on-site security. The instances becoming known as SCP-715-Bs if they made it that far. Yet somehow Patton, or whatever he really was, had made it through undetected, but that was far from the worst discovery Dr. Wrights would make. She used a number of the same anomalous optical enhancement devices to observe the SCP-715-A creatures within the pit, only to find that she and the other researchers had made a grave mistake. The SCP-715-As, they were all humans. What the Foundation had initially thought were the distorted, imperfect clone copies of everyone who had used the SCP-715 photo booth were actually the originals. They had been trying to climb back up because they wanted to come home. Their places taken by SCP-715-Bs. But none of those people, now twisted, disfigured, and unrecognizable, were able to explain to the Foundation who they were, and they'd been shot left to fall back into the pit and die. Acting fast, Dr. Wrights updated the classification of SCP-715 to Keter, although this was later rescinded back to safe. The creature that looked like researcher Patton was apprehended and brought in for interrogation. After learning the truth behind SCP-715, the photo booth was secured and locked up permanently. But as of now, the project investigating SCP-715 has been put on hold. No one at the Foundation wants to admit their mistake that they now have an extra-dimensional pit full of innocent, distorted people, or that they have no idea where all their body-swapped counterparts are. Diego had only just found his footing when it gave out underneath him again. 
Crashing to the ground, he threw both arms over his head just in time to protect his skull from the rain of boulders that came down past him. They grazed his arms and jarred painfully against his muscles, but it was better than having them hit him in the head. Without a moment to spare, Diego got straight up to his feet and continued running back down the trail he had been trying to follow. The ground shifted and lurched in all directions under him, threatening to throw off his balance at any moment. Having lived in Chile his whole life, he had gotten used to earthquakes, but he had never been in the center of one like this. The problem was that the trail he had been following to get up here was disappearing fast as the dust swirled into the air and boulders landing all around him. He just had to keep running in this direction and hope for the best. There weren't any other options. But suddenly, he found himself running uphill. Stumbling forwards, Diego tried desperately to get his bearings. He had spent the previous three hours hiking up the mountains, so how was it that now that he had turned around and gone back, he was still going uphill? It was almost as if the ground was changing shape beneath him as he ran. Dust filled his lungs as he tried to wipe it away from his burning eyes. Yes, the ground was definitely going uphill, but it felt almost as if it was lifting itself up beneath him, as if some tectonic plates were grinding together, creating a new mountain beneath his feet. Diego lurched unsteadily and grabbed the nearest rock to keep his balance, feeling the ground lifting higher and higher beneath him. Then, all of a sudden, the cloud of dust broke, and he was in fresh air rising ever higher into the sky. The Andes Mountains stabbed out of the clouds all around him, cutting beautiful shapes across the horizon. He felt his own mountain steadily growing taller than any of them. He dropped down on all floors and clutched at the ground in terror as he tried his best to take in the shape of what he was now standing upon. How far would you go to prevent a cosmic-level disaster? It's one thing to save your friends and family from an armed murderer. It's another thing to fight for your country in a world war. We can even just about imagine what it means to fight for our planet, to save our species from climate change, to save our world from a meteorite. But what would a cosmic disaster look like? A calamity so broad in scale that it surpasses our ability to even perceive the threat. We could point our most advanced telescope into deep space and look straight down the middle of it and never know it was even there. And if that threat was not simply to the survival of humanity or planet Earth, but to the survival of existence itself, how far would we go to prevent it? What cruel and inhumane measures would you take to have such a threat? Or better yet, how many people would you kill to save the world? This debate is raging right now as you sit here and watch this video. Not among the Foundation, but between two SCPs so grand in scale and so advanced in nature that the Foundation has no option but to sit and listen as the pair debate what to do with the human race. SCP-4568-1 was not difficult to discover once it started moving. In fact, it was almost impossible to ignore. Earthquakes have been tearing across South America for centuries, destroying homes, taking the lives of innocent people, and fundamentally changing the shape of our planet itself. What most people do not realize, however, is that the fault line running through the Andes mountain range has actually largely been dormant during this period. The source of the earthquakes has come from something far more mysterious. Our innocent hiker, Diego, had been spending the week walking among the Andes when the earthquake struck. You would be forgiven for assuming, as Diego did, that the ground rising beneath his feet was a new mountain forming as the tectonic plates clashed together. But the staggering reality of the situation was that he found himself hiking along the back of SCP-4568-1. As the creature raised its head into the air, Diego saw the head of a serpent lifting several kilometers away from him. Its body stretched and wound its way through the mountain range, filling the valleys and running beneath his feet. The scale of SCP-4568-1 is hard to convey. Measuring over 500 kilometers in length, this serpent is longer than most U.S. states, with a 20-kilometer width. Standing on the back of it quite literally feels like standing on a mountain range. 
For context, the horizon at sea level is about 4.8 kilometers away, so multiply that by 4 and you'll get a sense of just how wide this thing is. Even small movements from this SCP are enough to trigger continent-wide earthquakes, with tremors being felt all the way around the world. Upon the initial discovery of this SCP, the Foundation was unable to determine why it remains dormant for such long periods, and seems to only awaken sporadically and for brief periods of time. That was, until SCP-4568-2 was discovered. It is little wonder that the second serpent took so long to be found. Its body is comprised almost entirely of water, sand, algae, and steam. It does not show up on sonar scans and is incredibly difficult to detect in the water, even visually. Its form is loosely defined while dormant. With broadly similar measurements to SCP-4568-1, this serpent roams the South Pacific Ocean. Any marine creatures that swim into the SCP's body find themselves undergoing beneficial mutations. Crabs grow extra pinchers, bottom feeders grow larger mouths, and sharks find themselves developing heightened senses and even extra hearts. These marine animals seem to undergo virtually no distress and are free to exit and re-enter the SCP's body at any point. Initially, SCP-4568-2 was believed to be the peaceful one of the pair. Both serpents seemed to become active at the same time. While on land, SCP-4568-1 would wreak havoc with magnitude 7 earthquakes in major metropolitan areas. The sea serpent's function was less well understood. Employing resonant frequencies and vibrations, this SCP was able to give its watery body a distinct form as it rose up from the ocean and towered above the waves. In order to maintain its shape and control its movements, this SCP employed a huge amount of energy. However, the Foundation quickly observed that it was rarely able to maintain its form for very long. As soon as the sea serpent rose out of the water, its mountainous twin would begin to move, sending tremors around the world that disrupted the frequency needed for SCP-4568-2 to remain animate. Exhausted and unable to maintain its shape, the sea serpent would fall into another period of dormancy, gliding lazily through the oceans. But this dormancy suited the Foundation. Without the constant seismic tremors, researchers could work fast. Two operating bases were set up to monitor each SCP. Two mirrored bases with mirrored teams in constant communication with one another. As soon as one team made a discovery, it was conveyed to the others and vice versa. One operating base was set up high in the Andes Mountains, specifically designed to be as earthquake-proof as possible, capable of withstanding earthquakes up to 9.9 .9 magnitude. Meanwhile, in the South Pacific Ocean, an underwater research center was built just above the seabed, with regular vessels drifting out into the unknown to gather whatever data they could about the great SCPs. Several early findings stood out. Firstly, SCP-4568-1 appeared to have a very different internal structure from its twin. Researchers initially assumed that the creature would be largely composed of earth minerals and rock, as its exterior appearance suggested. However, scans of its body indicated the presence of what can only be assumed to be artificially created components. Great gears resembling clockwork structures and even rudimentary circuitry were present throughout the creature's body. The function or origin of these gears has yet to be determined, especially as there is no evident way that their movement corresponds to the autonomy and movement of the serpent itself. The far more striking discovery, however, came when the SCP Foundation discovered a way to communicate with the two beasts. Ultra-low frequency waves capable of traveling vast distances, even light years, were discovered to be emitted from the two serpents' heads at intermittent periods. The Foundation had to develop some of the largest antenna ever created to pick up these frequencies and interpret the data coming through them. What they found were two twins locked in a fierce debate about the fate of humanity and the universe itself. It was only then that the motivations of these two serpents started to make sense. In 2010, almost as soon as the Foundation was able to tap into the frequency, they were contacted directly by SCP-4568-1. Foundation, I know that you can hear me. I will not apologize for my actions. 
I know that I am the reason that millions of your kind face their demise. I know your pain, and I feel it too. But I shall never apologize for it. I simply ask you to listen to myself and to my... Word cannot be translated. You are curious. You can be patient. Exercise that, and you may one day understand. And listen, the Foundation did. Efforts to contain or destroy the two serpents were put on the back burner. Instead, Foundation agents prioritized spreading disinformation across South America and beyond about the source of these earthquakes. The two serpents are far too large and far too powerful to overcome or contain. Instead, the Foundation prioritized the use of amnestic drugs, disinformation, and the creation of fringe conspiracy groups to discredit any claims of the Serpent's respective existences. Meanwhile, some of the most senior leadership figures in the Foundation were, and still are, locked in a fierce debate as to what to do with the Twin Serpents. By listening to the communication between the two SCPs, the Foundation discovered that SCP-4568-2 is intent on wiping out the entire human race. The only thing that has prevented it from being able to do so thus far has been the existence of the other serpent. Every time that SCP-4568-2 begins to mount an attack on humanity, its land-bearing twin triggers enormous earthquakes to disrupt its progress. But why would the Sea Serpent want to destroy the human race? As Foundation generals gathered in the Deep Sea Operations Base, SCP-4568-2 came to the observation window to look them in the eyes as it told them. I am sure you can see it. How your world dies a little bit more every day. Mostly by your own hand, no. You poison the oceans, tame the rivers, blacken the skies. You do not need angels of death to destroy your world. But there is something else. I see it in the bottom of your eyes. Something unforgettable. Unconceivable ideas cloaked in madness and impossible colors. Do you think I would let you drag the rest of the world down with yourselves? Do you think I will leave this world, my world, to die in flames? It sees your world. And it comes in fives. Since this revelation, the Foundation has poured countless hours and resources into trying to identify a cosmic threat. For well over a decade, many of the smartest scientists the world has to offer have looked to the night sky, scanning for this impossible color, this shroud of madness, but to no avail. Some within the Foundation believe the serpent is lying trying to make up an excuse to justify its genocide. But information from SCP-4568-1 seems to confirm everyone's worst fears. Your minds burn bright from this, Hume. All of humanity shines from this rock, like a candle in a dark room. It sees you. An idea exists only because something thought of it. Have you ever considered how such terrible concepts could have been given form? What kind of atrocious mind could even think about it? Humans cannot conceive the colorless green. What if you are playing into this creature's hands? There appears to be an underlying implication that ideas are the source of power somehow. This colorless green, this unimaginable cosmic threat, seems to be a monstrous idea incarnate. But whose idea? Humanity's? There is a deep lore that the two serpents discuss with one another, one that makes little sense even to this day to the Foundation. They talk of gods and goddesses, deities of flesh, of steel and gears, and of the fives. Quite what these creatures are, if they are even creatures at all, is a mystery to the Foundation. Researchers have not discovered a way of communicating back with the two serpents directly. Attempts to mimic their language or transmit signals asking questions to them have largely been ignored. Instead, they address humanity and the Foundation as a whole, seeming to take the view of the human race as being a collective hive mind, one that they are evidently able to tap into. The pair seem uninterested in informing us as to exactly what this threat is or explaining who the gods and goddesses are. 
Perhaps they assume we know these things already, or more likely, they believe that our consciousness is not yet capable of perceiving the scale and depth of the concepts that they are debating. What is clear, however, is their shared understanding that if humanity were to be eliminated, the candle was to be blown out, this cosmic threat would pass by. The pair have names. Trenten is the land serpent, while remaining dormant much of the time in an enormous cave system beneath the Andes Mountains. This serpent seems keen to help the Foundation in some way. Kai Kai, the sea serpent, is intent on sacrificing the human race for a greater good, one far beyond our understanding. Speaking to the Foundation in the Andes Mountains, Trenten gave a short speech that served both as encouragement and a terrible warning of the darkness to come. It is something I like about you, Foundation, about mankind. While it is easy to just take the simplest path, to just give up, there will always be some among you who refuse this path, who do the right thing. Maybe not all of you are this strong, but I can see it in your methods. Those so-called containment procedures. There will always be someone who stands up against the dark even if it takes a thousand million years to emerge victorious. Maybe you can stop the thief. After all, ideas can be killed with better ideas, even if it takes a thousand million years. We've covered a lot here on this channel, and what you might have noticed about the nature of our discoveries is that knowledge is best broken down before digested. Which is to say, if you are to learn how to assemble a computer, it may benefit you also to see one taken apart. When you do so, you'll notice in front of you not a computer at all, but a collection of individual parts. It's in understanding these distinctive parts in isolation that helps us shape our awareness of their marriage and how they cooperate with one another to become their collective self. Sure, this may be good in practice, but then tell me, how do we comprehend a whole that is composed of parts unwilling to isolate themselves from the rest? Because, let's face it, not all things, let alone SCPs, can be torn apart for the convenience of our study. No matter the subject we seek to understand, it may choose to resist our deconstruction by one way or another. Landmarks like the Temples of Malta and the Pyramid of Djoser are held together by our respect. Monuments like the Statue of Liberty are held together by copper. The family was held together by Charles Manson. But it's not always the preservation of history or elements of the periodic table or psychopaths that reject humans' wishes to disassemble. Far stronger than forces of nuts and bolts are that of character and loyalty. And SCP-2085 is welded together by exactly that. SCP-2085 is a militant anarchist organization consisting of six cybernetically enhanced individuals, A1 through A5 and B, operating under the name Kuroi Usagi Shiden, or more commonly known as the Black Rabbit Company. SCP-2085-A subjects are five adult female augmented humans, designated SCP-2085-A-1 through SCP-2085-A-5. Subjects are genetic chimeras, each with an estimated 6 to 10 different gene donors. They are fluent in Japanese, Mandarin, Chinese, Cantonese, Korean, Russian, and English, with additional languages varying by individual. Subjects display an array of genetic and cybernetic enhancements, including genetic splices of Felis Catus physiology, that is, having cat-like ears, tails, and hair. These tails are prehensile and capable of holding small objects. So if you're accusing one of them of stealing your pen, don't just go searching their pockets. They also have grip pads on hands and feet, in case they ever did decide to retire from anarchy and take up surfing. Their impressive features don't stop there. If they haven't already put James Bond's gadgets to shame yet, just wait. Daniel Craig is about to look like Dora the Explorer. SCP-2085-A-1 through A-5 all have ocular implants with thermal vision, heads-up display, and recording functionality. Also noted are carbon nanoweave muscle fiber augmentation, reinforced endoskeleton, and brain-computer interface with internal hard drive. The list goes on, each etc. more elaborate than the next. Yet what stands out most about them is not a weapon, but an attitude. 
These six members, although now held in isolation from one another, do not show any signs of splitting up, not even when under the heavy pressure of the Foundation's interrogation. Agents spend their hours looking for cracks to dig their fingers into, trying to get one to betray the other and reveal sensitive information. But when asked to spill the beans, SCP-2085 screws the lid on tighter. They remain as a whole, resistant to our deconstruction. The agents get nowhere with their investigation, and with each minute wasted, it's another victory for SCP-2085. The hours go on and they keep stacking up W's, building momentum day after day, growing stronger and stronger as a unit. As the Foundation tries to tear the group apart, they respond with even greater resistance, and this style of resistance is unique to each member. Imagine you are confronting SCP-2085-A-2. She is talkative, and so you think you might get somewhere. You are all ears. But what SCP-2085-A-2 sees isn't ears, but troughs, and she is happy to feed you her slop. She talks and talks, and you listen closer and closer, but all you are getting is misinformation, false names, inaccurate stories, dates that don't add up. You focus and follow along, only to find yourself having run a marathon all the way to a dead end. Now you are faced with SCP-2085-A-5, who takes a different, more nonsensical approach. You are happy to no longer have to sit through inaccuracies to decipher truths, but now there are no truths at all. All that you are given are absurdities. She speaks in a way that makes you scratch your head, one saying for no apparent reason, I take a hammer and I break my legs. I break them for the better. After so many scratches, you swear you've dug an inch into your skin. And so you move on to SCP-2085-A-4, hoping for better luck. She is straightforward with you, that much you like, but she's hostile and doesn't cooperate. When you ask her her name, she raises her middle finger. She tucks it back in to create a fist, and then that fist punches the divider between you. No amount of reinforced glass could make you feel safe at that moment. Cracks spread. It looks like a web spun by a spider, and you feel as small as one. Thankfully, a protective shutter is lowered. Aerosol sedatives are pumped into the containment unit. She continues to try to escape, yelling profanities even harsh for someone locked behind bars. Your ears have taken a beating from curse words, nonsensical rambles, and heaps of misinformation. You want to lower your head into a toilet bowl and hear nothing but water. Yes, that is where these women have driven you. Your head to the bottom of a toilet bowl. You have put in so many hours, and yet, you have learned nothing new. And if you can't learn anything new, you might have to rely more on what you already know. But what do you know? Well, you know this. Their track record is quite impressive. Verified operations include smuggling, theft, assault, vandalism, kidnapping, extortion, property damage, possession of fissile materials, corporate sabotage, embezzlement, identity theft, fraud, copyright infringement, piracy, possession, transport, and sale of anomalous items, and, of course, tax evasion. Yet, when grilled under the heat of investigation, they do not reveal any details about the nature of these operations. You just know that they happened. All that is told is that SCP-2085 navigates in such a way as to minimize the chance of civilian casualties and maximize material and morale damage to their target. They are proud of this. It seems as if SCP-2085 perceives themselves on the side of good. While their list of operations on paper look like crimes, they stand proudly behind them, pleading guilty with a grin. But behind every smile is more teeth. Teeth that go beyond saying cheese. Teeth hiding in the dark caves of a sealed mouth. And you are determined to play dentist and find your way in. But SCP-2085 doesn't say, ah, for just anyone. So how are you to understand a group that resists our preferred methods of learning? How are you to properly assess the pieces of a puzzle when the puzzle is glued tightly together? It starts at the top. Before you can decipher the motives of a nation, you'd be smart to study their leader. And if you want to extrapolate the schemes of a football team, you'd interview the coach. And to truly know the moral of a television show, you'd be better off asking the creator than the actors. All of this is just to say, 
If you are to ever understand the complexities of SCP-2085, it is necessary you begin with SCP-2085-B, the person pulling the string of the entire operation for all of these years. Now, you might be imagining a man of many muscles, someone able to fight a bear with an arm tied behind his back, someone who kicks through saloon doors, tilts back his liquor, and walks out with a woman in each arm, or a cat girl. But you'd be dead wrong. SCP-2085-B, also known as Wizard, does not look like an imposing lead at first glance, or even at the hundredth glance. He is generally in very poor health, and his face shows it. He suffers from a variety of illnesses, most notably a vitamin D deficiency, acute radiation syndrome, and has unmanageable scarring from severe and repeated skin ulceration. He doesn't wear a cape and glamorous spandex often found hanging in superheroes' closets, but instead he wears an advanced crew escape suit, accompanied by a cheap bathrobe and flimsy red felt wizard's hat. He looks, with no elegant way of putting it, like a dork, a goofball, a doofus, a... you get the point. Furthermore, he is an adult male human with certain cybernetic and genetic enhancements. He has an adaptation of the gastrointestinal tract to allow for an all-liquid diet. Within his suit, an esophageal input port and waste output port are integrated. It is equipped with modifications to regulate sweat, reduce abrasion damage from extended usage, and aid in skin regeneration. His genetic enhancements include the replacement of 11 previously missing digits on hands and feet, and also has an internal drug pump, typically used for painkillers. Because, as we are about to learn, SCP-2085-B is most often on the wrong end of pain. Notice these modifications are not those you would find in a science fiction novel, but more likely behind the trench coat of a suspicious man in a dark alley. And we all know nothing good is ever concealed behind a trench coat. But have you ever wondered if that truth also extends to robes? Because when we pull open SCP-2085s, what we find is truly terrifying. SCP-2085-1 SCP-2085-1 is a fibrous mass of self-replicating carbon nanomaterials within SCP-2085-B's chest cavity, with growths protruding into the liver, pancreas, gallbladder, spinal cord, and left lung. The growth of the SCP-2085-1 and its consumption of SCP-2085-B's body tissues has been impeded through the addition of various containment implants used to sever communication between growth sections and control nodes and counter the replication process. SCP-2085-1's rate of replication without the influence of these containment implants is unknown. SCP-2085-1's periods of activity occur on average once every three months. The process lasts for up to 15 minutes and causes SCP-2085-B intense pain. Imagine a heart attack. Imagine Mike Tyson using your sternum like a punching bag. Imagine a cactus strapped to your front. This is the pain and torture SCP-2085 wears daily. There is no S logo printed on his chest like Superman. No symmetrically slick symbol like Batman. Instead, just cancerous growth. Kryptonite worn like a tie. The knot never to be loosened. But to SCP-2085-B, this anomaly is not just a number to be studied, but more so a being to be understood. It is more personal than a medical condition. It is something that he wakes up with each and every day. He calls it Red. At first, the Foundation saw SCP-2085's close connection with Red to be childish and silly, as if a small boy who names his freckles out of boredom and loneliness. But as you are about to see, how they met was more memorable than first finding a freckle in the mirror. A meteor struck down, and SCP-2085-B was the only person at the scene. Red was inside. As Wizard approached the meteor, Red leapt onto him and buried a home into his chest cavity. Far from a freckle on the skin, Red is a cancer. It grows and grows, leeching to what it can. It can't be removed with surgery. It can't be covered by a band-aid. It has no empathy or mercy. It leeches on and eats away at its host. But it's more than pain that it causes. 
Falling off a swing set and bursting open your leg hurts, sure, but at least both you and your injury are on the same team. Cuts try to heal. When left alone, injuries make effort to find homeostasis, but Red is a different breed. It hates us in a way that injuries are incapable of doing. It has a deep disdain for humanity. It tears Wizard down, reveling in his degradation. Its sole purpose is to eat him whole. Wizard can only take this personally, as he doesn't just feel the universally understood sensation of pain, but also the unique passion of its purpose. SCP-2085-B's adventures with Red seem to be where our story begins, and what ultimately keeps it moving. In fact, it was while SCP-2085-B was running around trying to fix his chest with implants when he eventually met who we refer to as SCP-2085-A-1 through A-5. He was at the clinic to get some new parts, and when he was going through the installation process, there was an explosion. One of the five girls barged out of a building, guns blazing. He started running alongside them with his chest half open. The woman embraced him immediately and reciprocated. Knowing nothing of the situation, he instinctively knew to take their side. There were bullets coming from both directions, but he intuitively understood which side was good and which side was bad. A distinction SCP-2085 believes the world needs help clarifying. But it is hard to see a reason for a war when our eyes are focused on the casualties. Beliefs are less clear when tucked behind bullets. The sounds of gunfire muffle their message. Morality, while a complex subject, SCP-2085 believes is simplified by the masses. Events are deemed good or bad based on the term used for them in a court of law. When we see the words smuggling, theft, assault, vandalism, corporate sabotage, embezzlement, identity theft, fraud, copyright infringement, piracy, and, of course, tax evasion. It is our impulse to label those as morally bad. But SCP-2085 desperately wants you to look beyond the language. They want the words to dissipate off the paper, letter by letter, until all you have is a blank page. Now look at the pencil and the hand that holds it. Watch how it moves. That is what matters. Whether it draws weapons or mermaids is irrelevant. Both can be used for good. Both can be used for evil. Intent is everything. And SCP-2085 intends on making the world a better place, or so they like to claim. But maybe there is more to it. After SCP-2085-B and the five women escaped the gunfire, they went on to steal a boat and hightail it out of Japan. They spent their nights out there on the ocean, stargazing and stuffing themselves with instant ramen and cheap beer. And surprisingly, between all the crazy adventures SCP-2085-B had been on, this is what Wizard spoke about most. The time spent on the boat out at sea. For the first time in ages, he was finally somewhere where he was happy. It was this moment that actually meant the most to him. It wasn't the children they apparently saved from imperialism. It wasn't the wealth they apparently redistributed to the poor. It wasn't any good deed at all. It was the selfish, almost shallow sensation of being happy on a boat. This singular moment meant so much to SCP-2085-B. He reflected on it as if it were a wedding day or a memorable vacation, which makes you wonder. SCP-2085 has been investigated and interrogated, and all that they preach is that they are doing the world a favor with their antics. Their tales are captivating, sure, but is it actually storytelling, or is it just virtue signaling? There is an emotional depth to SCP-2085 unique to any other militant anarchist group. While they are genetically designed to most efficiently complete missions, they are not all robots fixed on the high of task completion. Each and every one of them wants more. They want a group. They want a group not just to have the numbers to overthrow a government, but to have the numbers to fill a room, or boat, with companionship. When they refuse to cooperate with you and leak information about their operation, maybe what you are witnessing isn't the strength of their loyalty, but also the weakness of their codependence. And so you decide this is the new angle you're going to take with your interrogation. You enter the room with a new focus. You feel like an earthquake, eager to make cracks in their core. You isolate SCP-2085-A-4. You are met expectantly with hostility. 
You fight back with psychology. You cross your legs and put on your glasses as if to say, let's talk about that anger. Where does it stem from? She strengthens her emotional guard, but you keep prying. You say that it sounds like she is lonely. You say it sounds like her loyalty doesn't come from good character, but rather insecurity and self-doubt. You ask her if completing missions with her crew was actually a way to improve the world, or was it just an elaborate way to build a close friend group bound together by common goals? Did new missions sprout from necessity, or were they fabricated by fears of being alone with nothing to do? Were end-of-operation high-fives to celebrate good overcoming evil, or were they just excuses to feel the touch of another human, skin to skin? You stop there, and let silence do the rest. SCP-2085-A-4 sits with her thoughts. She is ready to break. And finally, she does. She says she's willing to provide video logs of the group's former operations. She's ready to cooperate. She's ready to abandon loyalty to groupthink and focus instead on self-improvement. In exchange, she kindly asks that she be reciprocated and that the sanction placed on her be lifted. You come to an agreement, and with that, you feel like your work is done. But is it? You're feeling cocky and accomplished. You forward the video logs to an isolated network for D-Class personnel to review, and you sit back and enjoy a celebratory drink. You have infiltrated and broken the mind of a genetically modified radical designed for anarchy. You give yourself a pat on the back, and you're feeling so great that the pat might even turn into a massage. But before you can indulge in that deep tissue level of self-admiration, the phone rings. Can it be a call from the president telling you that you're the greatest investigator of all time? Can it be that they need you to pose in front of a world-renowned artist so they can erect a statue of you in the center of town square? But the panic on the other side of the phone halts your daydream. Your stomach drops, as if a sudden plummet from a perfectly vertical roller coaster. You have fallen into a trap. The video log at the center of your negotiation was not all it was promised to be. The file, titled Backup.AVI, consisted of a two-hour-long video of a feces-filled toilet, presumably recorded from SCP-2085-A's point of view, accompanied by an audio loop of the folk song Koro Beniki, as performed by the Red Army Choir. Its absurdity feels like an art project, like a short film you are assigned to watch in a community college class. But instead of putting you to sleep, it does a whole lot more. The contained audiovisual cognitohazard induced anaphylaxis and exudative diarrhea in the observing D-Class subject. The D-Class subject died four minutes after initial access of the file from blood loss and oxygen deprivation. SCP-2085-A-4 sits in containment, laughing, while you sit there on your couch, dethroned, back where you started. Having thought you tore SCP-2085 apart with your mind, only to learn that your efforts only reinforced it with more glue. Throwing indestructible lizards into vats of acid. Hunting strange chicken men through forests in Ireland. Arguing in Latin with a man wearing a haunted Roman centurion's helmet. When you join the SCP Foundation, you might be expecting high-octane drama all of the time. Especially with the name Street Sweepers. You'd expect this mobile task force to be neck deep in some real action-packed street racing. Maybe you wouldn't think that they'd be tasked with driving all day every day in four-hour shifts tailing a semi-truck all over Birmingham, Alabama. But as Agent Moore and his colleague pulled into the lay-by behind the truck, neither of them were ready for what they were about to witness. SCP-2590 was first discovered by the Foundation at a routine traffic stop, investigating a totally different anomaly in the Birmingham area. Agents Peters and Smith had been posing as local police officers. The Foundation had been trying to track down an artifact that was supposedly being smuggled across the U.S. in the back of a nondescript station wagon. Peters and Smith had been allocated a pair of beat-up old police cruisers, which they'd parked across the dirt road fully blocking any traffic from coming through. It was several hours into their shift when the incident occurred, just at the point they were starting to lose focus. Taking a look through the suitcases and memorabilia from a family's trip to Disney World, Peters had taken way too long to hear the noise of the engine swelling behind him. He spun around to see the hulking shape of the semi-truck barreling straight towards him, Agent Smith, and a family of five. With only two seconds to react, he yelled out at the top of his lungs and dived out of the way, 
leaving the trunk of the car wide open with five screams emerging from inside. Smith, who had been sitting in one of the cruisers, only just managed to get out before the semi made contact. Eyes closed, Agent Peters waited for the inevitable sound of screaming rubber, the bang of metal on metal, and the shower of glass on asphalt, but it never came. When he opened his eyes, the station wagon was still parked up in front of them, the two police cruisers still blocking the road, and all of the Disney merch still piled high in the trunk. The semi was driving off along the road, on the other side of their blockade, with not a scratch on it. Without a moment's hesitation, Agent Smith, who had kept his eyes open and witnessed the whole thing, leapt into action. He ordered his partner, still lying confused in the dirt, to administer Class A amnestics to the family and call in for backup. Agent Smith himself jammed his keys into the ignition, twisting them so hard he almost bent the metal, and took off after the vehicle. What Agent Smith and Peters had just witnessed was the very first Foundation exposure to SCP-2590, fondly nicknamed Trailer Trash. As Smith pulled up alongside the vehicle and studied it for the first time, he made a note of its initial appearance over the radio, an appearance which remains unchanged years later. The badges on the vehicle claim that it is an international pro-star day cab semi-trailer truck, complete with an unmarked trailer. As the agent flicked on his lights and indicated that the vehicle should pull over, he noted that it didn't have any license plates on it, either front or rear. He leaned forward in his seat, trying to peer into the cab to make out the driver, but in the Alabama sun, the man just looked like a shadowy figure. They drove side by side along the road for almost a mile. The truck made no signs of pulling over despite Agent Smith's continued insistence and repeated flashes of the cop lights, but it also didn't attempt to pull away either. It just continued to drive a few miles per hour below the speed limit. The driver didn't seem to look across at him once. Having discussed it with Foundation staff, they decided it was best not to draw attention to the situation. They had no idea whether this SCP was hostile or posed any threat to civilian life, but having blue and red lights flashing at it appeared to be doing little to change the situation. Instead, he switched off the sirens and pulled in behind the truck, tailing it around Birmingham as the Foundation readied further agents to respond to the situation. For almost an hour, nothing of note happened. Agent Smith drove behind the trailer, watching it like a hawk. He observed that it obeyed every traffic law to a T. It never broke the speed limit, never cut anyone off, and left room for other vehicles to merge. If it hadn't seen it drive straight through a roadblock as if it wasn't there, he would have never suspected a thing. But then the truck turned its turn signal on. They had just come off the highway and merged onto a quiet side street, just as the sun was starting to hang low in the sky. The truck crept across the side of the road, squeezing its brakes gently, and stopped. Agent Smith matched the action the whole way, pulling up about 20 feet behind the trailer. In constant radio communication, he kicked open his door and stepped out into the evening air. Foundation personnel advised that he keep his hand on his gun at all times and approach with caution. He didn't really need them to tell him that. Smith called for the driver to step out of the cab. No response. The truck just sat there with its hazards on engine off. After a moment, there was a clunk, and the trailer door started to slowly open, all by itself. Agent Smith called in backup, but they were still several minutes out. Instead, he ran back to the car, gun raised, and waited to see what was inside as the door slowly opened to reveal nothing. No, not quite nothing. There was something small on the floor of the trailer, right in the center as if it hadn't been moved around at all by the vehicle's motion. It was red a kind of elongated cuboid. He reported it all to the Foundation over his radio, then paused when he recognized what it was. A Kit Kat candy bar, or to be more specific, a Kit Kat Chunky. What happened after this point was hazy. Agent Smith was found on the roadside just 20 minutes later, confused about what had happened. The truck was nowhere in sight. However, a security camera from a convenience store just up the street happened to capture the interaction. In the footage, you see Agent Smith approaching the trailer with his gun raised, looking at the Kit Kat. He tries to enter the trailer, but is unable to, so he approaches the driver's side door. While talking to the shadowy figure in the cab, he drops his gun and stands motionless, a confused and sleepy expression on his face, until the trailer door closes and the SCP drives away. Contact was re-established with SCP-2590 soon after, and has been maintained almost uninterrupted ever since. 
The findings made on that initial encounter seem to hold true across further examination. Personnel have reached out to Navistar International, the company that supposedly manufactures this model of semi-truck, but there appears to be no records of its creation or shipment to the U.S. In fact, no documentation at all can be attributed to the truck or any components on it. The driver in the front cab is a humanoid figure who is perpetually shrouded in shadow, designated SCP-2590-1. Attempts to reveal the driver's figures have proved ineffective, as even powerful spotlights do not shed enough light into the cab to render the driver visible. Quite what this driver's role is in the operation of SCP-2590 is unknown. SCP-2590-1 appears to have some proximity-based amnestic qualities, as anyone approaching it on foot has reported memory loss and confusion soon after, just like Agent Smith. As also discovered by the two agents and their roadblock, containment of this SCP is simply not possible. While the majority of the time the SCP is corporeal, it possesses the ability to pass through solid objects at will. All attempted roadblocks have resulted in the same thing happening. The SCP will just phase right through on them as if nothing was there. Since it cannot be contained in the usual way, a different operation has been set up to monitor the truck's activities, which so far have proven to be apparently harmless to the civilian population. Mobile Task Force Gamma-133, also known as the Street Sweepers, has been established to follow this SCP around Birmingham at all times. They operate in four-hour shifts, with two agents in unmarked vehicles sticking close behind the trailer at all times. The Foundation was able to fit a tracking device onto it as well, providing researchers with continuous location data for where they can find the vehicle. At seemingly random times, supposedly determined by the SCP itself, it pulls over somewhere quiet and opens the door to its trailer. The door will remain open for 60 seconds and then close again. Any attempts to enter the trailer have been blocked by some kind of invisible barrier, seemingly impenetrable to most approaches. More violent and destructive methods of entry cannot be authorized for testing, due to the heavy civilian population in the surrounding area. Every time the doors open, there is something different in the trailer. Researchers are trying to ascertain some kind of pattern or messaging behind most of the objects, but many seem to be random. The current list of things that have appeared in the back of SCP-2590 include an iPhone 3G, a red apple, and a lit light bulb without any visible form of power supply. Most notable about the objects in the trailer is that often they appear to be human beings, as happened on the night that Agent Moore was on duty in the Street Sweepers. The agents pulled in behind the truck as per usual when it slowed to a stop beside the highway. Agent Moore got out of the vehicle second, unenthused about the monotony of the task he had been assigned. Expecting to see a cardboard box or a chapstick when the trailer door opened, he was left shocked when he came face to face with himself. Few people can say they have seen themselves in real life. Most of them have been administered with various anesthetics to make them forget, but Agent Moore went on to report how bizarre of an experience it was. He claimed that it was utterly unlike looking in a mirror where your reflection is flipped and follows your every move. Seeing yourself standing in three dimensions, moving independently and evidently in a great deal of distress, is an experience that few would envy. Any time a human being materializes in the trailer, they appear to be in a great deal of distress as they attempt to escape through the invisible barrier. Agent Moore and his partner Agent Hall could do nothing but stand and watch in confusion as the copy of him attempted to free himself before. After the usual 60 seconds, the trailer door closed and the vehicle pulled away again. Several instances have occurred of duplicate humans appearing in the trailer, but each time the original person seems to have had no knowledge of this taking place and nothing out of the ordinary happens to them. However, there appears to be some small pattern demonstrating the SCP as an awareness of the Foundation, as it has also duplicated Agent Inglis's sister, who has no connection to this SCP at all. Incident 16 was the most distressing of all, as a large slab of metal appeared in the back of the trailer with the SCP Foundation logo painted across it. Agent Inglis and Schultz were on duty at this time and observed copious amounts of blood flowing out of the metal slab. Before long, the blood filled the back of the trailer, pushing up against the invisible barrier. All of a sudden, 52 seconds into the encounter, the barrier vanished, 
and a cascade of blood with the slab inside were launched out at the two agents at a speed of over 190 kilometers an hour, killing them both instantly. Since this incident, SCP-2590 has been treated with greater caution. The most mysterious thing to have come from researching this truck came on December 4, 2011, when, for the first time, the truck's tracking beacon stopped working. It had been seen pulling into an abandoned warehouse, and so a team of street sweepers was immediately dispatched to investigate. When they arrived, they found the vehicle moving through the warehouse at a slow crawl. Choosing to pursue on foot and leave a pair of agents at the entrance, they followed the SCP through the facility until it came to what agents described as a service tunnel or sewer of some sort. Putting headlamps on, they followed the truck down into the tunnel, maintaining radio contact throughout. As they reported the direction they were traveling and the distance, it quickly became apparent to Foundation personnel that this was no ordinary tunnel. The warehouse was positioned overlooking a cliff, and so the geography was not physically possible. As the street sweepers descended further into the tunnel, they noted there was increased levels of carbon monoxide. Radio contacts started to dip in and out, losing signal as they went further downhill. Just at the edge of their signal with the foundation, the truck stopped and opened its trailer door. Inside was just a single piece of parchment with the words, I'm just delivering a message written on it. After the usual 60 seconds, the trailer door closed and the truck continued. After they had passed the kilometer mark, the radio signal worsened quickly, and after a couple of scrambled messages, the team down there were not heard from again. The channel stayed open for another six hours before the Foundation made the decision to announce the agents missing in action. In March 2015, over three years later, a radio signal came into contact with the Foundation again from Birmingham, Alabama. It was from the headset of the squad leader who had gone into the tunnel. Initially confused as to who had gained access to the comms channel, the Foundation demanded that the agent state his full name and rank. The agent, himself confused, obliged, questioning why they were so suspicious. He and his team claimed to have only lost contact for about 15 minutes. They had followed the FCP a little further until carbon monoxide levels had risen too high to continue, at which point they had watched the truck disappearing into the distance as they walked back to the surface. All agents have undergone extensive psychological rehabilitation to settle them back into society, as well as classes to fill them in on things like the London Olympics, the Ice Bucket Challenge, and Gangnam Style. As for SCP-2590, it is back out on the roads, roaming around Birmingham, Alabama continuously, never stopping for fuel, always obeying the rules of the road, occasionally opening its trailer doors to reveal new and bizarre findings. Everybody remembered where they were, what they had been doing, when the SCP Foundation revealed themselves to the world. It was an event that had so fundamentally changed the lives of every person on Earth that it became pretty hard to forget that momentous, horrible day. Even though, for most people, it had begun as a day like most others. Dane Moss had been at home when it started. His roommates were talking about buying an air hockey table for their place, something to liven up their Saturday nights. Even as he half listened to them discussing it, Dane figured it would never happen. He was right, of course, but he never could have anticipated the thing that stopped it. All of them had stopped and fallen silent as the news report came through. A group calling themselves the SCP Foundation, previously responsible for the containment of anomalous objects, entities, and phenomena, had declared its new intention to exterminate the entire human race. Dane's split-second belief that the broadcast was a Cloverfield-style viral marketing stunt for a new movie was quickly disproved when the ground started to shake. Unbeknownst to him, the Foundation was not only real, but had detonated nuclear charges along the back of SCP-169, an enormous ancient arthropod that's body had made up an archipelago adrift in the ocean. The detonation caused the Leviathan to stir, resulting in massive earthquakes and tsunamis. Dane was the only one to make it out of the apartment alive. Elsewhere, Joe Reese had been grabbing a coffee on his way home from work. He briefly overheard the news report, but barely paid it any mind. Then, waiting for his flat white, wondering what the holdup was, he caught a part of a conversation between two people behind him. What is that thing? One asked. I don't know, but its face is pure nightmare fuel, the other replied. A bunch of pictures of it just appeared on everyone's socials. It's really freaky stuff. 
A sudden shriek went out from a number of the coffee shop patrons. Joe noticed a towering humanoid shadow being cast by something behind him. Its arms were stretched out disproportionately long, and it was attacking the two people behind him. Acting on an instantaneous fight-or-flight response, Joe ran. Without looking back to see SCP-096 slaughtering everyone that had seen its face. Around the same time as the Foundation's ominous announcement was played over every news channel on the planet, Renee Hudson and Sky Soto had been on a date. The pair of them had been enjoying hanging out, playing a few mildly competitive games at the bowling alley, but there was still something unspoken lingering in the air. Neither Sky nor Renee really felt any connection. They liked each other's company, but that was as far as it went. Although neither one of them knew how to broach the subject for fear of hurting the other's feelings, and in the same vein, neither of them could have predicted the commotion that would happen next. The noise came from outside, the deafening screams followed by a flood of people running for their lives. Hundreds if not thousands were fleeing, any that fell over in the street being trampled underfoot by everyone behind them. Human beings move like a mass of ants clambering over each other to get away from a gigantic, ferocious lizard. Despite the news broadcast declaring themselves and their intentions to wipe out all of humanity, nobody on the ground would ever be able to comprehend just why the Foundation unleashed SCP-682 and allowed the hard-to-destroy reptile to slaughter innocent civilians in droves. While they didn't know it or may not have agreed, Sky, Renee, Dane, and Joe were all lucky to have survived the initial anomalous onslaught unleashed by a rogue SCP Foundation. It did little to ease the pain of being displaced from their homes, forced to migrate across the country to join camps of other survivors, made refugees by anomaly attacks, and the efforts of apathetic agents of the Foundation. And of the four of them, not one could have predicted the shared fate that awaited them. During the months in the wake of the Foundation's opening assault on mankind, Renee and Skye had mostly stuck together. They had moved further and further south, managing to stay safe. Neither one had thought about their awkward date in months. They were just grateful to have someone they knew to stick together with. Meanwhile, Joe and Dane were hopping from one refugee camp to the next much in the same way, moving north and eastward, respectively. After deploying their first wave of anomalies, the SCP Foundation's efforts had shifted to primarily focusing on groups of interest that could pose a threat to their plans. While organizations with knowledge of the anomalous, like the Global Occult Coalition, were among the first in their crosshairs, the civilian population was left living in fear, but unscathed. That is, until the Foundation began targeting the refugee camps. One of their tactics was to unleash SCP-2241, a seven-year-old boy with reality-warping powers into survivor communities to act as a living weapon, destroying the larger refugee camps. It was the increased frequency and ruthlessness of the Foundation's attacks on human survivors that forced Skye, Renee, Dane, and Joe to unknowingly converge on each other. Camps for survivors started getting smaller, consisting of only a handful of people in the hopes that this would make it easier for them to avoid detection by the Foundation. Arriving and hopping off the back of a jeep with only the clothes on their backs, the four strangers exchanged uncertain glances. They had been brought to an abandoned dock, the wreckage of an overturned cargo ship laying on its side in the harbor. Shipping containers were scattered all around, looking as if they had spilled out of the boat and onto the dock. The driver of the jeep hadn't told them where to go from there. Instead, he had just driven off without so much as a word. The four of them looked around. Dane seemed particularly unnerved at being so close to the water, despite it having been months since the Leviathan settled back to sleep. Suddenly, one of the shipping containers burst open, and a broad, flannel shirt-wearing man stepped out. His face was buried beneath a thick beard, a shotgun resting against his shoulder as he approached the group. The man's stern, stony expression quickly changed into a wide grin as he jovially and unexpectedly pulled Dane into a hug. Welcome, my friends! <laughs> the man roared with laughter. Oh, welcome! Uh, who are you? Sky asked. Uh, of course, allow me to introduce myself. He responded, letting go of Dane, who needed to catch his breath after being squeezed so much. My name is Jovianus. For safety, I watch over this camp, the man announced. Ca camp? Joe asked, looking at the wreckage. The Foundation has been getting more zealous with targeting those of us that are left, Jovianus explained, gesturing for the four to follow him as he walked back towards the container. 
So we had to take a less conspicuous approach to surviving, splitting the camps up into fewer people, dispersing everyone around a bit more, and of, of course, he swung open the door to the metal container. Inside the cramped space, there were two bunks either side, one above the other, making four in total, along with a sleeping bag on the floor. Stand in place is the foundation one thing to look, Jovianus continued. We have to sleep in here? Renee asked in disbelief. Better for avoiding detection, the camp's protector replied. Otherwise, the next camp along is only 20 minutes away on foot, over in a warehouse. If you'd rather go there, but be warned, they have rats. Although it came with a brief adjustment period, the group quickly acclimatized to living in the abandoned dock. Each of them came to appreciate Jovianus' efforts to keep them all fed with what few rations they had. The four of them started calling him Big Joe, referring to Joe as Lil Joe to avoid confusion. Of the group, Dane seemed to have the hardest time adapting. He was something of a conspiracy theorist, anxiously talking about the other great disasters throughout human history and wondering if the Foundation had been responsible for them all. Sky felt a little sorry for him, so they decided to humor his theory that the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in Pompeii was also the SCP Foundation's doing, despite occurring all the way back in 79 AD. Through all their various concerns about surviving in this anomalous apocalyptic world, Big Joe seemed to have a talent for keeping the group's spirits up. Whether it was by recounting them all with folk stories or turning bland food rations into more flavorful meals, he made the four of them feel safe, especially with his weapon never far away. That is, until one evening. A glowing red streak shot through the air not far from camp, catching Jovianus's immediate attention. It was an emergency flare, set up by the neighboring camp at the warehouse. Something was wrong. Grabbing his shotgun and urging Skye, Dane, Renee, and Lil Joe to stay put, Big Joe left, running off into the growing dark of the night to try to help. The whole group stayed awake, waiting for their protector to return, the next hour feeling like an eternity. By the time he returned, the sun had fully set outside. Even by the low light of their lamps inside the container, it was clear by his face that any and all optimism had drained out of Jovianus. There was nothing left of all. There was nothing left. All of them were gone, he explained, unable to believe what he had seen. There was this oil everywhere corrosive like an acid, just burning through what was left of them. Trying to regain some semblance of composure, he urged the group to get some sleep, reassuring them that they would be safe for the rest of the night. Not one of them realized just how wrong they were, or that they'd never seen Jovianus again after they fell asleep. Rene was the first to discover he had gone missing, screaming with panic, waking up Sky and the two boys. After they had calmed down, Sky tried to rationalize what was going on. They were worried about Big Joe and the others, but he couldn't afford to lose their nerve and potentially attract the attention of a Foundation kill squad. It's the Foundation, Dane babbled, terrified. They found us. They're closing in. Oh, man. Relax, Sky replied. All of you chill. There are other camps nearby. Maybe Big Joe went to check on them, too. See if what had happened to the warehouse group happened anywhere else. You don't think he would have told us? Lil Joe retorted seeming to be the least concerned about Jovianus' whereabouts. We were asleep. It's not like him to wake us up. He knows we'd worry. Sky answered. What if he's dead? Renee sobbed. Don't say that, they replied. She's right, though. He left his shotgun right here. Joe interjected again. Whatever got the warehouse group killed him, it's obvious. At least I don't have to go by that stupid nickname anymore. What the hell, man? Dane yelled. You're joking at a time like this? What's wrong with you? There was an uncomfortably long pause. Everyone in the container turned to look at Joe, leaning against one of the metal walls with his arms folded. The other three were all thinking the same thing, although Dane was the first to say it aloud. You killed him, didn't you? Don't be ridiculous! Joe chastised him, backing away slightly, betraying his own little hint of fear. You and Renee are hysterical. You both need to calm down. Before Joe could finish his sentence, a withered arm reached out of the wall and grabbed his throat. It looked like the rotting, decaying arm of a corpse, protruding out of a puddle of black mucus that now seemed to be spreading across the inner wall of the container. Renee screamed in horror as more of the black substance oozed from the arm, melting away Joe as it held him helplessly in its grip. It was then that a face peered through the oily patch smeared on the wall, the nightmarish visage of SCP-106, the old man. For a second, Skye thought about trying to help Joe, 
They could have pulled him free, but it was already too late. The corrosion was spreading. It looked like it would melt them too if they so much as touched it. Joe was gone. The remaining three of them burst out of the shipping container they had called home, afraid for their lives. What the hell was that? Dane screamed. Oh man, I knew it. They've sent a monster after us. Sky barely paid him any mind, their attention grabbed by movement nearby. Someone had started running the second they had exited the shipping crate. They had been watching from a distance. Hey, hey, stop! Sky yelled, about to run after them. Sky? Renee's voice was cracking under the weight of her terror. Turning around, they saw it. The old man stood behind Renee. It looked even more grotesque under the low light provided by several distant fires in the ruins of cities the Foundation had destroyed, giving the horizon a hellish glow. SCP-106's withered, lipless face bore his rotting teeth, locked in a skull-like grin. It gave a sense he was gaining some twisted enjoyment out of what he did next. Renee had been frozen to the spot, sniffling in fear, her legs rigid and locked in place, until the old man clamped a hand over her shoulder, then she cried out in a blood-curdling shriek of agony. More of the black ooze spilled from his emaciated fingers, dripping down her front while Skye looked on in terror. Renee had been the one person who had been with them the entire time, from the moment the Foundation unleashed hell. Every camp they moved to, Renee was in the same one with them. The pair of them may have not been a couple, but she had been the only constant in this anomalous apocalypse. And now, this sinister SCP was killing her. Fighting every urge to grab Renee and pull her free, Skye instead let themselves be led away by Dane. Choking back tears, they ran alongside him in the direction of whoever had been watching them. The shadowy figure was just about visible, although definitely still close enough to be heard. In the dark, there was the sound of a fall, accompanied by a pained grunt, indicating that whoever had been watching the container had tripped. Both Dane and Skye knew that this was their chance. Together, they lunged at the figure before he had a chance to scramble back to his feet, with Dane pinning the observer down by his wrists. That was when the light of the burning city on the horizon illuminated his face. He was the Jeep driver, the one who had dropped them at Jovianus's camp to begin with, the only other person, apart from Big Joe, who knew where their camp was. You! Sky declared. What were you doing spying on us? I have nothing to say to you, the man spat. Answer their question! Dane yelled, slapping the man in the face, although he didn't seem to react. What is this thing chasing us? Why did it kill our friends? You might as well tell us, Sky told him calmly. After all, once that monster catches up, we'll all be dead. You were watching, expecting a result, right? Had to make sure none of us made it. Not that there's anyone left for us to tell if we did survive. He's with the Foundation, Dane gasped, catching on quickly. You had them send that corpse thing to kill us, man! SCP-106, the undercover MTF agent corrected. And yeah, it's here because we sent it. You all went underground hiding in your little camps. We had to look even closer to find you all. Ungrateful, all of you. Ungrateful? Sky exploded, enraged and offended at the idea anyone could justify all the death the Foundation had unleashed on the world. What, you expect us to thank you for hunting your fellow human beings to extinction? Dropping nightmare after nightmare on us, and we're meant to be grateful for that? None of you understand what we're trying to do, the Foundation agent replied without a hint of remorse. What we're trying to do is bigger, more important than your mundane little lives. The only way we can save humanity from it is by wiping you out. Before either Sky or Dane could ask what it was, a gloopy, oily smear appeared on the ground. Clawing his way out of it, the old man reached for the MTF operative, disintegrating him like he had done before, but the agent barely reacted, didn't cry out like Renee or Joe had. He was still, even as he was being melted by the slimy black secretion of SCP-106. It was as if the man couldn't feel the pain of what was happening to him as he died. A splatter of the same corrosive mucus spread onto Dane's sleeve. Freaking out as it began burning through his jacket, he desperately tried to wipe it off, only to smear it, spreading the dissolving substance further and crying out as he felt it eating into the palms of his hands. SCP-106 climbed out of its oily puddle, dropping the disintegrating MTF agent. He disappeared into the corrosive pool, vanishing from sight like he'd fallen into a ditch. Sky backed away, their eyes locked with the sunken stare of the old man, feeling their legs begin to freeze in fear just like Renee's. Gun! Dane rasped, laying at SCP-106's feet. 
slowly succumbing to the same fate that had befallen the others. Big, Big Joe's g gun, he rasped again. With the last of his strength, he used his arm to grab the old man's ankle, howling in pain as more of the black substance oozed from the monster's wrinkled flesh. Sky turned and raced back towards the shipping container, hardly daring to look over their shoulder. Every movement, every tiny shift of shadow they detected in the corner of their eye filled their mind with the images of the old man bearing down on them, wearing that sadistic, skeletal grin. Sky pulled the heavy metal door open, using all their strength to get back inside. Their arms were numbed, trembling so much with terror that it was like they weren't attached properly. They fumbled about in the dark, their fingers brushing up against the weapon, resting in the corner where Jovianus had left it. Pulling on the pump, Sky turned, the gun raised, knowing that the old man was right behind them, and pulled the trigger. It gave a redundant click. It was empty. No ammunition. The gun had been just for show. SCP-106 reached for the weapon and pulled it from Sky's hands, the metal of it slowly melting as it was coated in the tar-like corrosive substance. Recoiling their hands from it, Sky went to dash for the door, only to feel the old man's bony, burning fingers hook into their back and drag them towards the greasy black stain he was leaning out of, pulling them into his domain. This world had been a living nightmare since the Foundation had revealed itself, and unleashed an anomalous apocalypse upon humanity. But SCP-106's pocket dimension might just have been worse. Welcome back, dear viewers of SCP Explained. We hope you've been keeping well, and we also hope that your health insurance covers blown minds. Because today, we're using our trademark Anomatron 6000 to pit an anomalous legend against another Marvel legend. That's right, it's SCP-682 versus Dr. Michael Morbius of the 2022 cinematic masterpiece, Morbius. Of course, there is one issue that we should share with you before we begin. We haven't actually seen Morbius, however, here's the wonderful thing, statistically, you haven't either. In fact, we tried to get the Anomatron 6000 to process Morbius as raw data for the simulation, but our antivirus software kept stopping it. Intriguing. So instead, we simply hit randomized traits on the Anomatron, so it's free to use advanced AI could conceive what Morbius is like, and what his abilities probably are. And as far as you or I know, it might even be correct. So let's get this show on the road, and see if the hard to destroy reptile could hone against its own at cinema's most tragically memed upon superhero. Prepare for perhaps the most absurd and ridiculous video, with the exception of the Among Us video, that we've ever released on here. In other words, it's Morbin time. It began as many bizarre SCP Foundation stories do, with SCP-682 cracking the glass of its acid tank and preparing to spill chaos and terror onto Site-19. For most people, even seeing actual footage of this would be a life-defining traumatic incident. For most seasoned Foundation researchers, it was just another Sunday. When 682 busted through the nearest wall like a psychopathic reptilian Kool-Aid man, while guards engaged in the futile task of trying to subdue it with small arms fire, the senior researchers languidly made their way to the nearest secure panic room and hunkered down. As was standard protocol for SCP-682 escapes, all available mobile task force units would be dispatched, single-mindedly focused on cutting the lizard back down to size. But the problem was, this wasn't just any other Sunday. It was Super Bowl Sunday. And seeing as most mobile task force operatives are incredibly tough and manly, they generally love football and promised they'd definitely come and take down 682 as soon as the game was over. This would be one thing if SCP-682 was content to just terrorize the usual denizens of Site-19 today, but no. It'd been a while since the hard-to-destroy reptile had tasted civilian flesh, and he intended to rectify that toot sweet. In a state of murderous fury, 682 barged through wall after wall with the effort that a normal human might walk through rice paper. Soon enough, it was free from the drab gray walls of the containment site, and feeling the sun on its scales once more. Such a lovely day out, with the distant sound of people laughing and chatting, and children playing happily with their pets. 682 predictably found this disgusting and resolved to destroy them all. And with all those mobile task force operatives swigging beer, eating peanuts, and giggling at amusing celebrity cameos in Super Bowl <laughs> halftime ads, there would be nobody who would stop 682 from completing its dastardly task. Except, of course, one man, Dr. Michael Morbius. 
While 682 was escaping, Morbius was sitting on the deck of his private yacht, drinking a martini glass full of 2% milk because Morbius understands the importance of having healthy bones. He was listening to a fantastic podcast about the curative powers of beef jerky when high above the SCP Foundation activated the Morb signal, a Batman-esque light shining up in the sky in the shape of a clown. This was bad. Morbius paused his podcast and prepared himself, finishing the last of his milk and washing out the glass so it didn't get smelly. He raised his arm and summoned the Morb Orb, a glowing red ball that seemed to be the source of his powers according to a number of internet memes. He clutched the orb, feeling its power flow through him as he made a small prayer to his guardian deity, the late David Bowie. And with that, he took flight twin jets of fire blasting out of his shoes like rocket ships. He could only hope that he'd be able to intercept SCP-682 before it was too late. Meanwhile, SCP-682 was indulging in one of his favorite hobbies, just killing lots of people. He'd invaded the American city of San Fran Angeles, New York, which was known for being the biggest population of people within the proximity of Site-19. 682 was truly rampaging. He knocked the ice cream cones out of children's hands, causing them to weep profusely. He literally kicked dogs, and he also murdered a number of adults with his vicious fangs and claws. The local police attempted to stop him, but they were hopelessly outmatched. They attempted to cuff the monster several times, only to find out that by the time they were halfway through trying to read the beast its Miranda rights, it would break free and rampage yet again. All in all, 682 was having a grand old time, and was delighted that nobody was coming to stop its rampage of utter devastation. It seemed almost as though the rampage would never end, until a dark shadow fell over the ravenous reptilian monster. It turned up its head to see a new foe floating above it. Was it a bird? Was it a plane? No, it was Dr. Michael Morbius, of course, wielding his trademark flaming trident of justice. Another lamb to the slaughter. 682 growled, Are you ready to meet your end? Morbius laughed and shook his head. I don't know who you are, you scaly monster, but for hurting all these innocent people, you're about to get morbed on! And with that, he threw his flaming trident at the reptile, striking brave and true. But it wasn't enough. 682 had developed incredibly strong reflexes after years of the Foundation's attempts on its life, so Morbius would need to try a lot harder than just using his classic beloved trident to end this fight. Even then, before Morbius had a chance to think up another method of attack, 682 had adapted and switched to the offense. Two great dragon-like leathery wings unfurled on the monster's back, and it took to the air lunging towards Morbius with fangs born and claws at the ready. Before Morbius knew it, the creature's jaws were ready to close around his head. Thankfully at this moment, another one of Morbius's classic superpowers comes into play, his short-range teleportation abilities. In a moment of reflex that would impress 682, Morbius teleported out of the monster's path, remanifesting instantly floating a few feet away. 682 growled in irritation. Of course it would never be so easy, it said. The Foundation always sends one of its freaks to distract me. You may think you're strong, but really, you're just another puppet. I've never heard of this Foundation, Morbius quipped back, and I'm not your standard hero either. I really blur the line between hero and villain entirely. In fact, before Morbius could finish explaining what a complex character he was, if you could even use that word, 682 flew after him again. This time, however, Morbius was ready. He lifted up his arms and unleashed another one of his patented attacks, opening up human mouths in the palms of his hands, which unleashed miniature yet still extremely powerful air-to-air -air missiles. The missiles blasted out and struck 682, causing an impressive explosion. But 682 was well-versed in explosions. He kept flying after Morbius. He needed to get out of here fast, or he'd become a lizard's lunch. Morbius turned and flew in the opposite direction, the hard-to-destroy reptile hot on his heels. The first step, of course, would be to get away from populated areas to limit collateral damage. No matter what happened, Morbius refused to let this mysterious entity harm more people. You cannot run forever, 682 growled. Your wretched life will be brought to a slow and painful end, stranger. They were passing over the water now, flying at quantum speeds, watching the Pacific Ocean whiz past beneath them. That's when Morbius noticed it and had an epiphany. A volcano 
and by the looks of the smoke rising above it, an active one, too. Morbius had a plan now, but to execute it, he'd need perfect speed and timing. He stopped in midair as the beast flew towards him, but moments before 682 could make contact, Morbius grabbed it, executing a perfect mid-air suplex, and tossed the roaring beast directly down into the volcano below. For any other monster, this would be the end of it. But for 682, a double, triple, or even quadruple tap was often required to reliably incapacitate it. Morbius's work was not done. He flew down towards the volcano, ready to engage in the next hectic stage of battle. <laughs> Bet you're not feeling so cocky now, you nasty reptile! Morbius yelled, but the reptile in question was too busy flailing around in impossibly hot magma to reply at the time. Such is the way when falling into an active volcano. SCP-682, burnt and charred, but still alive, began to crawl from the top of the volcano, wheezing out smoke and ash. How could such a strange, confusing creature have been such a formidable opponent? No matter. It will destroy this Morbius. It might just take a little longer than expected. Little did the unfortunate reptile know, Morbius was preparing his next weapon, perfect for immobilizing this ornery monster, an eight ball in a gym sock, forming a kind of dangerous makeshift flail. It was the kind of lethal improvised weapon that would strike fear into even the strongest of enemy combatants. And now SCP-682 would learn to fear its power. As the flame-broiled reptile began to stand, perhaps preparing to adapt to its latest set of injuries, Morbius began relentlessly beating the hard-to-destroy reptile with the 8-ball sock, dazing it with repeated brutal strikes that never seemed to stop. Morbius had learned this technique from years of being involved in vicious bar fights, normally caused by him cheating at darts. This can stop any time you want, Morbius yelled. You just need to stop getting back up. Initially, 682 wanted to remain defiant, but even it could not deny that being struck again and again by the 8-ball sock was actually extremely painful. Was it really worth the fight? After performing some quick mental calculations, SCP-682 determined that, no, it probably wasn't. Time to throw in the towel. Okay, okay, 682 said, mostly just annoyed at this point. Oh, stop rampaging. Honestly, you just took all the fun out of it. 682 just sighed and laid on the ground, exhausted, slowly regenerating from its injuries. Morbius smiled, content with his victory. Who knows how many people he'd saved by luring this creature away from a population center. By this point, the Super Bowl was over, and the legions of mobile task force operatives, who technically should have done this hours ago, finally decided to suit up and take care of business. It didn't take long for black tactical helicopters full of Foundation soldiers to triangulate the location of the volcano where the end of 682 and Morbius's epic battle had taken place. It wasn't long after that that there were copious Foundation boots on the ground. This story, of course, has a happy ending. Mobile Task Force agents successfully recaptured SCP-682 and returned it to its containment cell in Site-19. And in the process of recovery, they mistook Dr. Michael Morbius for the actor Jared Leto, and shot him roughly 30 times in the chest with armor-piercing rounds, killing him instantly. Want an anomaly of your own? Check out www.scpswag.com for high-quality SCP merch. Now go and check out SCP-096 vs. Siren Head, and SCP-076 Able vs. Chainsaw Man, who has the most lethal weapon for more wild vs. battles.